agriculture during this baby meeting address. Care. We have all of them, everybody here. Because it's a lot of stuff. Questions get asked. A lot of stuff goes on. Well, so on that, we are excited about the report because it's emptied of all the old stuff, and we found. If you go into your email, can't you get into the same? Yeah, I can get into the shared drive, but I can't get into my. All right, this thing's gonna take a half hour to load up. So I see what you're saying. Okay, doggy doggy. Supporting documentation. Yeah. Okay, you're ready, um, Mr. Dumas, for the budget recap with me. Yeah. Okay. I never saw Megan after I walked out of your office. Okay, thank you. I mean, we're not we're not pulling anything. Yeah, all right, I guess that's good. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Not like I'm pushed. Right, but we would we would be deliberating. I mean, the whole thing is deliberating. Agenda has to be posted 48 hours in advance. No, I don't mean that, like, written agenda. I mean, was it not in the written agenda? It was not in the written agenda. It's part of her overview. Yes. We're just, all we're doing is is um, adding detail to Lauren's overview. Oh, as I have part of the center that. school. But what's the, but I think we're talking about this. So this oh, is because yeah, I was, because we didn't, there was some confusion, well, I don't know about confusion about who was doing preschool, whether it was going to be Karen or Lauren. So because it didn't We're get done a lot more staff, chairs, that's what this is. It's not an yeah. overview. It's what she's going to go through. So this through. is part of center school. Oh, maybe yeah. that's where they need their okay. Yeah. No, um, it's supposed to be one. Is it bothering you? Is it cold no. already? It's better it's than it was already? last week. Oh, it's better than it was last week. Last week was very cold. I mean, I can text him. I already asked him to make sure that can we just get a fireplace? Yeah, right here. Sure. And I'll move is that in the board. budget? Yeah. That's cold. Yeah. Open flame lights for that. I don't see why that's a problem. They have plug-in ones. I really think it's True. nitpicky. That'd be attractive. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Ralph, we're gonna do this. All right. We might really enjoy the this. whole ambiance better. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I don't. I don't. And then you're gonna, and I'm gonna do this. It's your turn, Brandy. Uh, who, one of my friends, oh, Pam Wexlox has a heated steering wheel, too. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to the Thursday, December 8th, 2016, Hopkinton Special Meeting of the School Committee. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I will take a quick run through our agenda for the evening, and then we will get started. Um, we have reports to the school committee, which include a budget recap and budget reports, including Center School, Elmwood School, Hopkins, Middle School, High School, and Athletics. There will be one opportunity for public comment, and then there will be items by consensus and then adjournment. And we have one more budget meeting scheduled for next week. Yes. Um, I believe Mr. Kamalo and Mr. Manning are here to join us this evening. Um, if you feel like being closer to the action, there are two chairs here for you. If you want to be in the comfy seats, we completely understand. But either way, give me the high sign if you want to comment or ask a question on something. Because um, I know I'm always looking back and forth. So. Um, and I believe we can get started with the budget recap. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to, for, for the benefit of those watching from home, I'd like to thank all of our honored guests for being here tonight. We have a, a big number of the administrative team here tonight, all of the principals, two of the assistant principals, the director of special education. Um, thank you so much for all being here tonight at the end of an already long day. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. I think this is a really great way for us to be able to have a, 
a, a, a budget that is connected, you know, from, from special education, from the elementary, right through the high school. And it helps people who are following along to be able to follow along and see the connections between all of our schools working together um, to come up with this budget proposal. So um, I'll begin with the, um, the recap from last time. The only change, and you, you see it in your highlighted uh, program recap page, um, you should see some green and some blue and some yellow. Um, and the blue would be the increase from the only increase since last week's um, meeting, and there are no reductions since last, me last week's meeting. This increase is um, to the technology budget, and it's to allow for the addition of a subject matter leader in that department. And I've asked Mr. Ghosh to come to be here tonight to explain the reason why we, um, through some changes in his department and some um, exciting opportunities for differentiation, um, that we'd like to be able to bring on a position at very little cost increment that can have a big impact. So Mr. Ghosh, could you come and, and join us here at the microphone? Thank you. Good evening. Good, evening, good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, just to give a quick overview, uh, obviously over the last several years, the um, technology department has grown in a, in a positive way, um, helping uh, teachers and, and students uh, kind of achieve better and really have a more dynamic classroom, in my opinion. Um, and with that, obviously, has come a lot more responsibility, uh, professional development, and responsibility uh, in the technology department. So this position um, would help the department in a few key areas. Uh, the first and the largest, in my opinion, would be professional development. Uh, right now, although we do from time to time have uh, independent contractors come in and, and run professional development sessions for the district, um, our department does um, facilitate a lot of the professional development within the district. So primarily myself, a lot of the um, tech integration specials that work in my department will run a lot of the trainings for our teachers and for our, our staff. Um, so this position would primarily um, support me and the professional development in the district, coordinating um, the various events, the full professional development days, uh, would arrange for some summer professional development. Uh, on top of that, they would help with some of the evaluation process uh, of the other tech integrators in the, in the district. Um, and I think it would be a nice added position and it would help us deliver not only better professional development but also could save us some cost uh, because obviously having some in-house run professional development is much cheaper than paying outside contractors to come in, especially during the summer where that's the biggest challenge for us. We have to pay other people or our teachers to come in in the summer to run these workshops, uh, which can be quite expensive. So those are some of the key areas, I guess, uh, and reasons for the position. As a reminder to the school committee, sure. could you explain what the SML role entails in terms of teaching load and sure. so the primary, non teaching load? Uh, it's, it's kind of split between a uh, 0.6 and a 0.4. So uh, the 0.6 position is primarily doing the things I just described, helping evaluate um, other teachers, helping organize uh, professional development, um, really helping uh, assist the various principals with trainings and events. Uh, throughout the district. Then the, four, the point four would be primarily a, a teaching position, a coaching position, uh, where they would be working one-on-one -on -one with teachers, uh, working in PLCs, uh, running training sessions at department meetings, and, and things of that nature, helping within the individual buildings. So that would be the point four. And so section. in the current structure, um, that those responsibilities in terms of the um, support in the classroom, that, that really falls on the technology <coughs> integration specialist rule, correct? Correct. So this would provide support to those individuals yep. as well? It would, yeah. And 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 looking at other staff as well, paraprofessionals obviously uh, are a big part of our, our group and require a lot of uh, specialized instruction, and, and spe especially around assistive technologies. Um, so this, pos this position could help kind of run those trainings as well. And, and so, Mr. Ghosh, when you talk about the position, are you, you're, you're not talking about um, you're not talking about an additional person, but Correct. rather changing the um, responsibilities of one of your already existing. Um, That's personnel. correct. This wouldn't be this wouldn't be an ask for a whole new 1.0 FTE. This would be primarily um, funding a stipend, which would obviously we'd look to hire you know within the district uh, to fill that spot. But it would be ideally a teacher that, that fills that role. 
And I guess the only other thing I wanted to comment on is that um, I think the way that we do the budget process and, and the fact that it happens as early as it does means that we're thinking all the way along the way about what this, how this can help us with our program implementation in the fall. So these are, as we start to think, I mean, you might be thinking, well, why haven't we heard about this sooner? Well, that's the reason, because as we go through, well, what, what are some ways that we can reduce the budget? What are some ways that we can prepare ourselves for implementation, programmatic implementation and improvements? We're constantly asking ourselves that question. And in this regard, we started to think about, would there be a role for a director position? Um, and, and determine that we first want to take a step towards an SML, evaluate um, whether that is something that, that we think is needed, and perhaps as part of next year's um, budget cycle, think about whether or not there's, there's room for a director position or the need for it um, in that regard. Is that That sounds fair? correct, yeah. Any <coughs> comments or questions from the committee? Um, yeah, can you just tell me the cost? Uh, it's seven, and Ralph has the exact number. I think I it's 71. It. 29. 29. Right, I didn't know right. if I did so, my yeah. math right. Okay, my math right. That, that's a $5,500 like stipend per the contract plus three additional days okay. also per the contract. Because it seemed like a weird number. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that's the only change to the revised program um, recap. The other... Um, oh, I'm, I'm sure so sorry. No, I just didn't know if anyone else had any. Sorry. Did anyone else have any questions about it? Okay. I, I just, no, my <laughs> fault. My fault. My mistake. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the other thing that ha that came to our attention since last week um, was the fact, and I'm going to read part of this. This is a letter that's going to be going out to the community tomorrow. That has been brought to our attention by Conley Bus Company that there are two bridges in Hopkinton that are restricted to vehicles over eight ton eight tons. When did we meet on this? Monday. It was, right. Um, these bridges are located on South Mill and on North Mill. Our school buses weigh approximately 15 tons, fully loaded. In a meeting with Conley Bus, Hopkinton Police, and Hopkinton Department of Public Works, it has been determined that any school bus that presently uses these streets should be reroaded to circumvent these bridges. So what this means, yes, that's, that's what we said too. Um, we're presently redesigning, this, the transportation department, I should say, is presently redesigning routes for the following eight buses, so for eight buses, and this letter is going to go out to 135 families tomorrow, letting them know that we're working on this, hoping to have it in place by the new year. Um, we'll certainly be notifying them with advance notice of any changes that are going to take place, but we thought it was important for families to know that it was coming rather than waiting until it was on their doorstep. And we wanted, we wanted you and the community to understand why this is happening at this point in the year, simply not something that no, nobody was aware of. Um, but we do anticipate that we will be adding a new bus to accommodate the re rerouting requirements um, in order to get students to and from school in a timely manner. Um, Ralph, do we anticipate that there'll be do we know what the cost might be to that additional bus? Uh, we do not. We will have a conversation about Conley about this. I'll negotiate from zero for this year uh, because they've been riding these streets for many, many years and never brought this to our attention. This all started in a neighboring community um, and as a result of a moving violation ticket that was given to one of Conley's drivers, they directed all of their drivers in all of their towns to report back to them uh, any situations like this. And that's the first that we knew uh, of this particular issue. So we did meet with DPW and the police department. Obviously, now that we know about it, we don't think there's any imminent danger to anybody, but now that we know about it, we have to take steps to, uh, to alleviate the problem. And as Dr. McLeod said, um, um, oh God, I just had a senior moment. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, as uh, Dr. McLeod said, um, we really do have to, um, we have to address this. Uh, and the issue, here's what it was, is the timing to get through those neighborhoods. There's room on the buses, but because of all the backtracking that's going to be needed to avoid 
uh, these two little areas, uh, we really do need another bus at this point in time. Where this is going to lead us for next year, we don't know. With some advanced planning, we may not need the bus, an extra bus. We just really don't know. Right now, we have no opportunity to really dig down. Uh, the other, other option would be running mini buses that don't weigh as much. I said to John today, the problem with that is that we currently have three buses servicing this area. We would need nine mini buses in order to service it. And Connolly just can't come up with nine drivers or an, an additional six drivers uh, within two weeks. So, uh, so question about this is, so we now know the issue, um, although I am a little shocked that no one on the bus drivers mentioned it before, but regardless, we're at where we're at. So <laughs> are we still driving over the bridges right now, or have we ceased? We have no option right now because we haven't had, since Monday, we haven't had an opportunity to reroute the buses and communicate with all of the all of the families. And it's actually uh, more than 300 families of we, students. Um, we have not been advised by the police that we ha cannot drive over the bus, over the bridge okay so we're acting on it immediately with as soon as we were notified yeah. um, but we did have police at the meeting and DPW um, the Connolly the, the, the person from Connolly representing Connolly said that there were also issues in Norwood and in Medfield Medfield and, in um, and so we were not advised to um, to tell people that they could no longer finish their routes, I don't we think were advised. Signage. I'm, I'm there on, is signage. They had a picture of the Mel? sign. Mm -hmm. So the question I have on top of that is that it, those, I mean, some of those bridges have been repaired in recent years. Are those uh, tonnage limits still current? Like, has anyone looked at whether or not any of the changes in structure or whatever have increased the amount that can be or I asked that question of the longer one of the two bridges I don't know which one it I is think that's South Mill. South um, Mill. and yeah. and um, mr. Westerling explained to me that the, the structure of that bridge is such that because it's an embankment I don't know the proper it's terminology earthen. there's an earthen dam there there's yeah we can't improve the structure of the bridge that's a great great question that would seem some um, we can't do anything to that particular structure. So we bring it up tonight as part of the budget conversation because the second page in the packet that was handed out tonight is revolving accounts. And just as a, an advisor, you may have to tap into the um, bus fee revolving account um, this year if negotiations at zero don't pan out and certainly next year um, once we know um, if we need an additional bus in addition to the one that's already been presented to you for the west side of town so fortunately we do have um, a buffer to cover it there so uh, this is not for tonight Mr. Jamis, because obviously none of us had thought about the questions ahead of time and, and obviously if any of you have other questions certainly you, we'll, we'll get to them I promise but I just want to understand we've had some surprise expenses come up in the past couple months in a few facility related matters where we were talking about revolving accounts and where we may be able to pull from and things like that so is there my request would be that in a coming meeting not one of our special budget meetings but a coming regular meeting that we have a deeper dive into what we were looking at for revolving, revolving accounts for some of those special expenses, and I think the boiler being one of them at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. Just so I can understand, because I have concerns that, like, now that this is an additional potential expense, where are we falling? Rather than waiting for our quarterly report, mm -hmm. where are we falling? Sure. Um, sure. Because I, I don't have John's brain where I follow the numbers all that closely, yeah. and so I... Well, I, I don't have a good sense. What, what you see here, with the exception of an additional cost, potentially, for a school bus, is the most up-to-date information in all of those revolving accounts right. that I could possibly provide. Right, but does that provide. include this, like, projected what we're trying to do with the Hopkins 
builder. And does that? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's already been factored in to the building use um, account. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. I had a question about the, the bridges themselves. Have they been inspected to be sure that the number of trips that have been made by these buses over the bridge, that they're still safe to be traveled over? I and mean, that it that, seems like a number of years mm -hmm. that buses that are almost twice as heavy as what their bridge is intended yes. have been going over and to be yeah. sure there's no damage. To well, we can bridges. certainly do that. I would also point out that we also had a, a when we were having the conversation with the, uh, John Westerling, we asked about snow plows. Right. We asked about trash trucks. And um, he, at that point, wasn't 100% sure about it, but he was certainly going to look into it and take appropriate action where where he had to. The issue is not necessarily the weight, it's the number of axles on the vehicle. So if a vehicle has more axles, then the vehicle weight gets spread out more evenly. So you could have a trailer truck with three axles go over the bridge without, uh, potentially without an issue. Whereas a school bus, which only has two axles, can only weigh, I think it's at eight tons. I'm glad you did that explanation, Ralph, because that, that was an important yeah. consideration. Thank you. Yeah. But we'll certainly uh, ask John uh, Westerling to have his folks look at um, the, the areas. Nancy, I will um, get the information out to all of you. Um, and in fact, I will get the information out to all of you on the most recent bridge inspection and the results of that. And just to jump on that, so I know you had this joint meeting, and I'm sorry if I'm not remembering all the parties involved, but the Board of Selectmen were notified? No. That we were having the meeting? They were not at the meeting. But of the I'm, issue, assuming that, mean. I'm assuming that they've been notified by, um, he's right here, Mr. Kamalo. No, I know. So I just didn't know if it's his first time hearing of it. You, you knew I about it as well. I would doubt it. He's aware of it. Okay. Anyone else have so questions? Just, I mean, it, it is to the revolving account point, it is just worth noting that um, when we think about the potential impact of this, we are currently committing $75,000 more than we're projected to take in from the bus fee account as is right now. So if we do have to add an extra bus, the $175,000 of revenue is a year over year number. So if we have to commit $310,000 to it next year, then it's not next year that I worry about it. So at some point we're, we're running deficit there. Yeah, um, when I made the, the presentation about central office, I pointed out that the reason that we were able to, to commit more than we took in is because of the uh, fuel adjustment um, credits right. that we accrued last year. Um, and based upon the price of diesel so far this year, um, I, I have every reason to believe that you will have a similar uh, accrual this year. I think it was about $65,000 next year. Of course, who knows what's going to happen with a new administration and, you know, whatever impact that might have on the price of oil. So you're saying we would reduce the commitment to the revolving account if we get that adjustment? Right. Okay. Yeah. That'd help. Okay. Um, so the letter's going to go out. There's, I think there's also a daycare right at the bridge on South Mill. So go to all the I assume it's going to all those families too it's only going to the people who ride the buses that are going to be impacted by our transportation department right I just don't remember how like if after school care right from the daycare yeah, but you're going off the bus roster not the we're going off the right. bus yeah okay right. so I just want yeah. but um so the only other point I'll make aside from the post-traumatic stress of hearing this because my kids have ridden those buses for 20 years um, is that you know if this is going to be a significant expense this year that is going to impact our revolving fund and our ability to add the bus that we already know that we need for next year this might be an occasion where we have to ask the town for the emergency funds that the appropriation I mean, certainly this is one wasn't anything that anybody anticipated but it also isn't the job of the school committee or the school department to inspect the bridges um, or to make sure that they're, you know, <laughs> that they can support the weight requirement of, you know, that just seems a little bit outside our purview. So if this is something that we're not going to be able
able to find in the context of our own budget or that it's going to impact have a ripple effect on what we're able to do next year in terms of what we already know we need to do for um, for our enrollments I would really strongly urge that we consider other sources as well any other comments just expecting to see my bus number on that memo so oh, <laughs> do you want to know if it's on 16 I'm sure it is yeah No, no. 16 is not on the memo. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. Do you go over the bridge? No, but There's we're in the neighborhood right there, so oh. I thought they go in and help me. we would be impacted by it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So the rest of uh, that analysis was something that John had uh, asked about uh, last week. And it's, it's called draft one at the top. Draft two is behind it. And draft two will only be referred to uh, after we have a conversation, if we have a conversation about preschool um, additional needs. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or if you want to um, work up your questions and ask them during the next week so that we can get answers for you um, between now and next Thursday. Or bring them to the next Thursday's meeting. Obviously, it was just handed to you, so I don't really expect that you're going to uh, um, have a whole lot of in-depth questions right now. In the last page there, John asked about Circuit Breaker. And this is the past um, seven or eight years of Circuit Breaker funding history. And you can see that it's ranged from a low of uh, 44 percent in FY11 I think that might have been a 9c cut year although I'm not a hundred percent about that uh, but it was a, a lean year uh, budget wise uh, at the state level and the highest it's been in FY14 and FY16 is the statutory maximum of 75 percent uh, uh, please understand that uh, the, it's not the reimbursement percentage is just one of many factors that goes into circuit breaker. Um, there is a, um, a circuit, and it's based upon the foundation budget. And four times the foundation budget, roughly this year, $42,000 per student, um, is paid for by the district. The circuit gets broken when you pay a dollar more than the $42,000. That's when the reimbursement percentage kicks in. So the amount of money that you get reimbursed is based upon um, well, the, the amount of money that we're getting this year, $395,000, was based upon what we spent last year, predominantly on out-of-district placements. The expensive, um, uh, the expensive cost to educate special needs students doesn't all have to be out-of-district. Um, we do have some students who, in district, we get some um, uh, reimbursement for, but we first have to demonstrate that we've expended more than roughly 42000 before it kicks in. And, John, I know you had asked me this question um, earlier today. A year ago, when we were doing the budget, last December, we estimated that we were going to get $391,000 this year. We got 395000 so, you know, we we're pretty close because we know who the kids were. Yep. And so that's kind of why I feel confident that 400 is going to be the number next year. It's not the same kids, but based upon where they are and what we're paying for them, using a 65% reimbursement percentage, it's just being con uh, uh, conservative, we figure we're going to get $400,000 next year. So once again, any questions? Happy to try to answer them either now or in the future. <coughs> Anything else? All righty. Thank you. On. Budget reports. We are starting with Mrs. Hugo and Center School. And Dr. Zaleski, if you would join her, that would be great. Thank hey, you. Lauren. Welcome. Sorry. I am good. I'm sorry. Good. Good. Do you want to stay in the crowd? Do you want to come up here? What? 
No, we have two extra seats up here. That's why I was asking. Yeah, right here. <laughs> you're very if you don't, if you're comfortable chair. where you are, you're fine. Ah, Mr. Her. Sorry, I didn't see you hiding back there. Front row seat right here, Mr. Her. Just let, should I let everyone get settled? Sure. Yes, I'll do that. <laughs> Did we end up using the tape recorder? He went he over there took and it took it took a lot of beeping and he okay. never came back. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you really fast. The Grinch <laughs> took it to his workshop. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. <laughs> well, thank you for having myself and Dr. Zaleski. We are both here to first talk about the preschool program. So starting that transition while I talk about center school needs, preschool needs as well, because we soon will be under one roof. And tonight's goal is to share a bit about preschool, and we do have some needs, but going into what, what is so unique about the preschool program. So to talk about preschool, we have worked with a consultant this past year, Dorsey Yearly. She's done some work throughout the district working with the team chairs, really helping us analyze the preschool program, looking at what are our strengths, what are our areas to grow, and what are some things that we can do to better support the needs of our preschool students. So as she's worked with staff, she has um, conducted faculty meetings with us, she has worked on interviews, intakes, and taking all of this information and helping compile it, even working down to developing uh, a shared mission and what is our purpose and helping drive what is it really that we're here for our preschool program. So something that came out of these discussions was really helping convey to the community and the school committee how unique a preschool program is as part of the public school. So something that is a challenge compared to other grades throughout the district, preschool has what's called rolling admissions. When a child turns three, it is now the responsibility of the public school to educate that child with special needs. Prior to that, they receive their services through early intervention. Most grades, we've received some summer enrollments, but most children are in the district, so you understand what your grade population will be and it may grow over the course of the year but for preschool it's whenever those children turn three and you don't always necessarily know who is turning three down the road so as we looked at that a challenge that came about that rolling in mission is staffing a program appropriately in the past we have always staffed our program based on our fall number who we anticipate, mind you, in the spring when we're um, beginning the year because we'll have children that turn three over the summer that were not in Hopkinton at the time or have since moved in. And that has posed a challenge for us because over the past few years, and I'm sure you can recall, we have continually come to the school committee seeking additional staff for preschool. That's something our consultant really highlighted and we are not setting ourselves up for a successful preschool program because we are playing catch up along the way. While we understand our mindfulness to set up what we need, we are continually then shorting our, our students and having to seek that addition. So another factor for preschool is that half of the population, 50%, are special needs students. So that, and I have a chart that I'll go over with you, that is significant. No other grade level in the district has 50% of its, its students that receive special education. That is the primary purpose of the preschool program, but with that it comes quite a demand in terms of providing services for those students. Do you want to add anything? No, I, just to give you folks a little bit um, more history too, uh, Ms. Yealy started this work with us last year. So last year she conducted a full analysis. She worked through Teachers 21 and um, prior to this work, because Lauren and I saw the need, as Lauren stated, continually coming to the school committee and asking for supports every time somebody entered the district, we felt it was a very reactive approach. And um, that's what, just so you understand, that's why we outreach consultancy and said, you know, we need to look at other models across the state and see how we can enhance our programming. So um, that analysis happened last year with some recommendations to restructure the program, which is where we're at this year. So when you look at the district as a whole, the current population of the district is 13 percent students with special needs, preschool is 50. So the, there is a chart on the, your um, document. If you turn over, I will explain it to you. We've gone back a number of years to show the history of preschool. So looking at October of 2012, 
We began the year with 15 <coughs> students in our preschool program. We ended with 37. When you look above, you'll see the total district enrollment, so you can see shifts that might have occurred, and there's no greater difference for the district as a whole or even special education students as a whole. But when you look at the, the trends from October to June for preschool, many years there's quite a significance in that, in that number. Um, where we are now, so each year we've done that for October to June, where we began the year, where we ended. For our October 1 count, we had 33 students. You know, our state collects that October 1 count throughout the districts. What do we have? We had 33 students enrolled. Already we now have 37 as children have turned three. So we don't know what the June number will be, but we anticipate it will be at least 47 through the EI transition meetings that our team chair has been able to attend. We try to promote that positive transition to the public school outreaching, early intervention, meeting with families to help provide the best um, support as well as what's appropriate for that child and what they require. So as we take in this account, working to be proactive instead of reactive, we will be looking at the structure of our program, how we can welcome more students in, community peers, as well as to students with special education needs. And to do that, we do have some needs. Mm -hmm. And just to help you understand what a program restructure may look like, um, so we use the term reactive, which is, you know, for instance, a student may come in and require one-to-one. -one. The grid says that they need a one-to-one. -one. We assess it. The need definitely demonstrates they need a one-to-one. -one. What this approach would do in the restructuring is look at the number of students and the needs and look at how we can appropriately staff the program so that when students come in, it, they don't automatically get a one-to-one -one because we'll have an appropriately staffed program. So there wouldn't be a continual need every time somebody moves in unexpectedly to continue to seek staff. Um, and it really is reactive because not only do we need approval from you folks, but we also need to find the right fit. And we find ourselves posting for the position and so oftentimes scrambling to find the right staff. And that really isn't the best approach. So with this restructuring, there would be a stable amount of staff in the program stationed, prepared for students to come in and to receive the services. So, and we've also taken into account transition plans for now as well as when we move into the new building and this would also support that program in the new building looking at it, a program approach collective responsibility as well as meeting student needs but uh, when students are able to to join our program having the support that we're able to support them successfully and our we have a fabulous program it's NAEYC accredited we want to make maintain the quality preschool in addition to meeting the students um, special needs requirements. So with that in mind, hopefully you have an understanding of what un is unique about preschool in terms of that rolling admission and the 50% of the population with special needs. To help support that transition to that restructuring of the program, we have three things that we are asking for. It is um, we have, and I'll describe them to you, a point five FTE C power professional. And this is to provide, we know that we have some students joining our program in January. And these are some students that we have assessed, we have had meetings, we have had evaluations, and we already know that right now we're not able to support what they require. Another request is a point five again, FTE for a level C paraprofessional. We've re evaluated our students in our program currently. We've looked at support, suggestions, and um, taking in scheduling. How can we examine other opportunities to best meet these needs with the staff that we have? And we um, have exhausted those opportunities and while making certainly excellent efforts to accommodate those needs. We do need a, a 0.5 person to um, support that. And then the final ask is a 0.9 FTE level C professional for this transition. As students are coming into our program, that assessment, that mm -hmm. ongoing evaluation, they might be coming to us from early intervention with a robust service plan. Ours may look different in the public school, but we can evaluate that and determine what they need with the program support instead of everyone coming in and have the same um, service delivery, if you will. That provides us with flexibility to transition children, provide that support. Many of them, it's their first time away from home. It's a brand new setting for them, and that would provide a successful transition and flexibility with that. Okay, um, so I just want to clarify one thing. So, I, and thank you for explaining all of that. I do have one question that might clarify a little bit 
because I always forget the levels of paraprofessionals and um, because there's definitely different needs yes. that they can address. I know you've explained it a million times to me, Dr. Zaleski, and okay. I'm sorry, it just doesn't stay. It took quite a while for me to understand yeah, as well, but I'm good now. But I want to clarify for the committee as well, yes. like, what we're discussing for tonight and what will need to be on the next agenda. So we're the, the, there's an ask here for starting in January, but we didn't have that on our agenda yet Correct. to um, take any action on it tonight. Okay. So, but it, it, it falls in the need to discuss tonight because it falls in line with the budget for next year. So understand the explanation for tonight. But we won't take any action on this for the current year until our next meeting when we have it in the agenda for the next meeting. Understood. Um, so I want to just clarify that for the committee and how we're going to work it tonight. This all was important to have as part of the discussion and part of the preschool program for next year's budget as well. Um, but can you explain to me again what a level C paraprofessional is? <laughs> sure. So the level C paraprofessionals, they um, work very specifically with data collection and data analysis. And also they're providing the highest level of care to students with the most intensive needs, whether it's for discrete trial training or other interventions related to their service delivery, again, for students with significant needs. Whereas the level B paraprofessional would be providing in-classroom supports and modifications um, and accommodations to the curriculum. And so there, therein lies the difference. Not that a level B cannot assess data, certainly they can, but not to the extent that the level C would um, be analyzing data and providing directed feedback in alignment with the student's needs on their plan. And there's different certifications for a person having those qualifications, right? So the, the state has come out with a new requirement for um, C-level paraprofessionals. Not all C-levels have this certification because it is very brand new. But what I've done um, in partnership with our BCBA is look at that criteria, and that really is a criteria we use when we're hiring level C staff to ensure that if they don't have the training, that at the very least they have the um, experience in that realm. Um, for instance, we wouldn't hire somebody who's never done discrete trial training. So those are the you know, key indicators that we look at when we're hiring a level C paraprofessional. Any other questions? So, uh, because I had the luxury of previewing this this morning, this might be a good opportunity for us to talk about version two. Sure. Um, just to clarify, um, version two assumes that we will not need the point nine next year. I just want to make sure that I'm good with that. Is that the understanding, somebody? Yes, yes, okay. I am. Okay, with, with all that in mind, the, the cost in FY17 for the 110 days that remain from January 1 on is $37,248 for all three of those slots. Next year, um, you will need the 2.5s, and the total cost will be $34,644. So we were scrambling to try to figure out where that could come from. And so we go to draft two. Draft two, the two um, cells that are highlighted assume that those dollar amounts that I just mentioned would be charged to the preschool tuition revolving account in both cases. So it would have no impact to the overall operating budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, yes. <laughs> Although I'm a little, I'm, I'm confused. It might, it might take me a while to formulate. So just first of all, to be clear, the conversation that we're having right now is about the FY7, changes to the FY17 budget, basically, finding money in FY17 to add staff, which which we have to do from time to time. I, I, that's fine. Um, that's one part of the conversation. The other part is, are we going to look at the FY18 budget? Well, I think that's what they were just talking about, so that the 2.5s would carry over into FY18, and the 0.9 would not. No, no, no. I, I understand oh. that. I mean the whole budget. Like oh. we, we usually have, like that, the whole little packet that we got for center school or the other schools. So um, some of that, the um, staff summary and the. It does not include those. Does not include these three positions. Um, I'm I'm saying, are we going to see that? 
So, can I apologize for the confusion, Mr. Dumas? I can't Mr. do Dumas. It very well on here, so. Um, you're right, Jean. So, it is confusing the way in which we're presenting this tonight. And um, I, I want to acknowledge that the, it, all of the work that's taken place for the preschool program, I think, got in the way of where does it belong? Yeah. So, it didn't get included with the special education budget because Lauren has been so involved in this work. Um, so, we need to get all of that information. All right. Because I know what you're expecting is to be able to look at the staffing and the dollars right. and the ins and the outs, which and put it in my nice little tab. And I can I, I completely understand yeah. how, how this feels confusing. So all we'll right, so we're just going to not talk about that for tonight. Right. Okay, that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, and then I I do have one more question. I just want to make sure I understand what you said um, correctly in my own mind. But basically, um, improving the staff that we have available does that impact what I thought I heard you say is that because we don't have enough staff then when we are getting new students their IEP will require then a one-to-one -one that we have to add so is it the situation that if we had more appropriate levels of staffing in the first place that when they were coming in, their IEPs would not need to be written with that in it. So it would not be requiring the mid-year addition of the staff. Is that kind of the point? That is the point, along with the fact that it, it's not just about the staffing and the one-to-one -one need, which that is definitely a very big component. But it's also about the instructional component. So mm -hmm. we're reworking our instructional strategies with these students, too. So that way, when they come in, oftentimes students come in from other placements, even if it's not EI where their grid reads that they're, they're highly specialized, receiving one-to-one -one ser services, maybe even almost in a pull-out setting all day long. It could be in a really, really significant intensive program. Um, and we're working to really integrate the students into a model, an instructional model, where they are with typical peers. They're getting exposure to grade level curriculum. And, and that's going to help us in the upper grade levels with the gap. Because these students, the more exposure we give them to grade level curriculum content and materials with typical peers, the, the mindset is that that will foster growth, higher order thinking skills, and give them a better access to the curriculum. So part of it is about definite one-to-one -one staffing, for sure. But the other part of it is instructional ex exposure. Okay. And that's the whole point of the pre-K pre restructuring. And so just at a really basic level, sort of improving the, the richness of what you're able to offer on an on starting from the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. should mean even though that might sound like front loading or whatever should really balance out or reduce the the requests that we frequently do get across during the year which happen after the budget and are a little bit more challenging so what might sound like putting people in the waiting corral mm -hmm. is really just evening things out and and improving the quality up front and consistent across the year for everybody is that yes that's get okay yeah. that's what I that is understood from it yeah. so then my final question um, related to what Ralph just was saying about the um, preschool tuitions I know we did a few years ago we looked at our, our um, tuition for our typical students and maybe this is not the year to do it but I would think when we're getting ready to move into the new building, that would be a good time to reassess and just make sure that we're competitive because mm -hmm. um, it is a great offset, and I think it's a pretty good bargain um, for a really exceptional program. So that's just my final good thing, comment. Good point. Thank you. So can I just ask one question just to, to clarify back to what Mr. Dumas was saying? So the point nine position <laughs> would appear in the budget for FY18, but it would be charged differently. So is that – or is the – Point nine going away. The point nine is for FY17, so it would not okay. be in the FY18. Right. This budget. is just to help us with the transition. Okay. Okay. So the transition to the program changes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Gotcha. Any other questions? Mr. Kamal, Mr. Mr. Manning. So, um, so we're talking about FY17 staffing adjustments mid-year, mm -hmm. right? So inside what you guys have. For a budget today, and that's your so, it's, but it may roll to 18. No, so it will roll to 18. Roll. So, the, the purpose of the report was to demonstrate that they did a review of the entire program and that these are the recommendations that they're making. They're 
the recommendation is one to start January 1 with these three staffing requests for the remainder of the year and then and they're discussing it here because we're about to talk about the preschool budget overall and for 2018 but that in 2018 only two of those three staffing requirements for this year will be necessary in next year's budget we are not taking any action on the request for this year this meeting because it was not on the agenda and it is not appropriate to take up tonight but it was being discussed in light of the programmatic changes being made for next year as well that's right okay so that makes sense and i'm sure you guys will figure all that out um, <laughs> you big preschool is that the same preschool is our we have two preschools or no preschool? that is the preschool the, the integrated preschool that used to be in the middle school is that now in the center school it's at Elmwood and school Anne's right next to you so that she is housing our preschool program You're the right now. Of that I am. <laughs> <laughs> when the new building opens we'll have that all fixed right. the center school principal or has the center school principal always been the principal of the integrated preschool like when it was in the yeah. middle school they really didn't have a principal and that was also a, a child well Al Alan Alan oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Alan was <laughs> All right, I should redact. <laughs> Alan was the principal, uh -oh. but it was challenging. Faculty meetings, professional development, middle school staff, preschool staff. So it wasn't, um, it, it's a little different now. And it will all go across the street. Yes, it will. When the mud pile goes away. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the center school budget, which is up 128 grand or whatever it is. It's part in the integrated preschools in that number. No. Does so actually, yeah, there? that's what I was asking for. Pre preschool, preschool is, is, is embedded in the special yeah. education mm -hmm. budget. So this is where it gets tricky because preschool, the preschool is a special education program. Currently, the budget falls under the special mm -hmm. education budget. The reason it's being discussed yeah. tonight, however, is that, and in more detail than it normally would, Brian, it would have been embedded under Karen's report, which is where the dollars are in any changes. Um, but because of all of the work that's been going on, Oh, since last year on all of the changes that they're describing tonight it felt that it made more sense to have it under Lauren's report but I can see now that that caused all sorts of confusion so I'm only halfway through my confusion I think that's a uh. <laughs> but then we go over Dr. Zaleski's budget last week yes and wasn't that in that in those numbers no preschool's not in Karen's no. oh, <laughs> when we when we had Dr. Zaleski here this um, plan reorganization was not yet completed okay. so it was not this year, that's right okay. so it. it was not factored into the F, uh, FY 18 sped budget so we should expect next we week it? an updated sped budget yes, with this included in it yep correct okay so this mm -hmm. is you'll have to above and beyond last week's yes. but the beauty is that the the administration is going to recommend that it be funded through preschool tuition so that it will not increase the operating budget whether the school committee ultimately uh, agrees with that is is up to the five will be a nail biter for next week right <laughs> sort of like you're just strong-armed <laughs> next thank week you. but you sound you. like superheroes thank you for noticing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any <laughs> other questions, Mr. Manning? No, you just answered my question. Okay. Which okay. Was, going to be, was it going to be in the uh, above, above the bottom line in terms okay. of the that, that, that That'll be the recommendation, so Mike. So. so. <laughs> okay. Mr. Kamala, are you all set? Okay, you can continue. <laughs> center school. So you center school. Okay. Oh, I'm done. Okay. Thank right. you, Dr. Zaleski. Thank you for being here thank tonight you. as well again. So that'll be three weeks in a row we get we'll to see. Them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. So now I'm able to talk to you about center school. I envision as we move forward in our under one roof, it will become clearer in terms of what I'm doing now for center school for preschool, even though preschool is funded through special education because it's a program I think we're trying to begin that navigation and we will certainly shore that up for you 
So now I am pleased to talk to you about Centre School, and I think you will be too. Um, so our budget for next year, when we are planning for FY18, we are now planning for 478 students at the K-1 level. We're a great place to be, and I think people know that. So when we look at first grade next year, we are planning on the latest NESDAQ numbers for 252 students. We will continue to have our 11 in first grade, so that's 23 students in a class. Kindergarten, we are anticipating 226 students, and that will average 23 students per class. So I will say those numbers are higher than we like. I don't have any other options um, in terms of carving out another classroom space, so um, we know this is another year of higher classes than, than we would certainly like to see. When you look at our overall budget, something that I hope that you took away you know, from my perspective, there's not much in it, which is intentional. We have benefited from the school committee's support of our initiatives over the last few years, our transition to full day kindergarten, our need for a BCBA, a shared literacy coach with Elmwood. So we are in great shape to meet our student needs. So we're continuing to enhance and to grow that. Our focus remains on those alignment with the strategic plan, looking at our effective instruction, our adjustment to practice, and we're able to do that with the staff that we have now continuing with our professional development and our expansion of um, providing supports as we grow and meet the needs of students. When um, Ashok mentioned the professional development in-house, we have a lot of great resources that we're able to use to benefit and strengthen our instruction, which in turn impacts student um, achievement. And that also includes social emotional learning, that we are working on addressing that as well. And we are able to do that without any such new positions. And I'm mindful of what other buildings need. So as we look at what is a need, what's a requirement, and I know that we are in, in great shape, thanks to you. When we looked at our supplies, we really looked at what do we have, what do we need. Last year, we were fortunate, and it's an aligned program, K to do. We have an approach, a um, sequential approach to phonics. It's called Foundations. If you're parents, you might have heard it, seen your children tapping. So we, um, when you look at the expense account, the supplies and materials, um, the Foundations was in the textbook account. We don't need to buy that. We now have consumables that you support that program. So while it looks like it went up a little bit, it's the consumables for that, that program to support that. We did look at reducing all items that we can. My goal is to deplete our supplies of paper, tape, staples, so that we have less to move, because this will be our last year in center school. So we, we certainly want less to pack. And that, that, is, that, yes. that is it, quite honestly. There's not, I mean, you might have questions for me. Some of the things, I mean, the enrollment is um, something that I really wanted to make sure you um, heard. Last year, we had a projected enrollment of 440, and we have 455. Quite significant was last year, we were anticipated for 204 kindergartners. We have 228. So we definitely have a young population coming to town, which is wonderful. Um, so we are prepared to meet their needs. I just want to cir sure. circle back to what you had said about the classroom space. So if there's a large influx over the summer, which I know periodically we get more than what we're expecting, yes. there is no place to expand with another classroom. It's just going to increase the size of the class. It is. So we have currently, we have some classrooms that have 24. Our ideal target is 18 to 20. And it was um, documented, I'm going to say, a number of years ago by a committee the town formed. What is your target grade configuration for the schools? What is your ideal class size? And for the K-1 level, it, the target is 18 to 20. However, we have surpassed that. We are out of options. We literally do not have another space for a classroom. We could build a new school. Yes, we could build a new <laughs> school. Faster. <laughs> Cannot come fast yes. enough. There you go. Nancy, to the to the degree that you know, I think most of you know this, but Lauren basically gave up her office. There's no art room. There's no music. I, I mean, know. they no, have, I am aware they've of taken yeah. every corner. Uh, there's no technology lab. Anything that used to be shared space is now a classroom. So despite that, in the carts and the traveling, children 
are learning that's a great place to be so there are definitely we have certainly learned to be flexible share um, and this is adults as well and um, that aspect will be missed when we move to the new school but it certainly will be welcome to have space and you have been creative I know in the ways you have used it so working working off of that I don't actually have any specific questions about the budget it seems very straightforward and again we all know that in more ways than just the classrooms you're doing more with that space than anyone could expect um, the I guess the question I have maybe is an ask for post this budget but certainly before next budget and I'm looking at mr. Dumas because certainly before you're out of here um, it occurs to me that we're going to have that this is not going to be the case for your budget next year. Correct, because we will have 11 kindergartens. We currently have 10. Right. So the new building is set for 11 kindergartens. I will be asking for staff for that kindergarten classroom. Yeah, and so I'm wondering if we could get a high level okay. projection at some point of I mean that's that's straightforward but it's a whole new building it's a bigger building there are right. probably other things. I know some of it is covered in the building yep. project itself. But if we could get a projection of sort of what we would expect a center school budget might look like from an increased perspective, just we have that line of sight before we get into next year's budget. We, we had to put together a projection for the MSBA. Oh, great. Uh, as part of the feasibility study process. Uh, I know, for example, uh, an additional custodian because of the additional square footage mm -hmm. would be in there, additional uh, electricity costs. And they were really done with a thumb in the air. Yeah, but we might but, be able to get something a little bit, and yeah. even I mean, if we involve, I mean, we could probably involve Compass and get their yeah. guidance into what they usually see. Yeah, they helped increases. us with it, actually, okay. in terms of the utilities. Yeah. So I just the other that, thing that I would add there is that, Mrs. Dubot just stated, that we're depleting our supplies, so we don't have to move as much. Too. What do we have to increase to get back to the levels yep. that That's we true. need for so that year? Yeah. You may see an increase with supplies and materials. Um, because yeah, I just don't. I just don't want. That's a good point. I mean, uh, we're obviously going to do everything we can to support the what we're going to need to move into the new building and make it success successful. But to the extent we can have a line of sight we'll know it's before yeah. the budget process, so we can kind of already that can already be socialized when we think about that. That would be that, that would be helpful. Well, and with an eye towards what's being installed as part of the new building project, yeah. like whiteboards and it's you know, all that included. kind of stuff it's all included in the cost yeah. of the building right so okay. we won't see those for a while with budgeting we won't be see be seeing replacement of correct that type of materials but yeah like Lori was saying the depletion of supplies yep yes I think I heard a rumor that there's not going to be a principal at the new school <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to live, never live that way. I know you're not. I thought you were just going to say, I'm never going to leave. The no, 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 no. I couldn't see him behind everybody in the chairs. Oh, that principal. Mrs. Birchman, did you have any questions? Thank you. That was really good. Okay. Um, let me just check with our uh, honored guests. Did you have any questions for Mrs. Dubow? So, in the new school, with the additional space and the Assuming the additional staffing goes through, what will happen then to the class size when we get to that, the numbers we're targeting and as part of the plan? That is a fabulous question mm -hmm. because we had to um, go back to MSBA, the building committee, to state our case for an, the enroll, they certify enrollment and what you're projected for. They had an, originally given us a, a low number that we advocated for more. They granted on what is permitted, not what is planned. So our enrollment for the building is 355 in MSBA's view. So that is something the building committee has talked about. We just had a meeting this past Monday and that we'll be revisiting. With the 11 kindergarten classrooms, 11 first grade, we would have 22 in a class. So it's not meeting the target of the 18 to 20. Um, and that's something that we'll be talking about with the building committee. If we had 22, I mean, has that been our number over the years? 22 is high. Can I just yes, add to, Lori, uh, to Lauren's comment? So um, we have been provided with recent enrollment projections from the from NESDEC. And I went to the planning board and had this conversation. This is not something that, this is, this is a surprise to everybody. In fact, the ESBC was under the impression that things would level out. So we might have a big year 
on opening year and we might not be where we want to be but things are going to level out and that's fair enough because that comes from the pr projections that we've been working the assumptions that we've been working under until suddenly we had a whole different projection that instead of showing flat growth is showing significant ongoing growth over the next 10 years which is what I reported to the planning board at their meeting um, can I just clarify something you said the ESBC was expecting flattening it's the MSBA no the ESBC at their meeting last okay. week or yet well, this week so so the because just to, but when we went to the MSBA yes. 11 was all we could get oh yeah we yeah. knew we needed more we, we really the optimal no, but, was more okay. than 11 classrooms per grade level we got them up to 11 so that's the max number based the, on the co-funding and all the other formulas. yes that's the max number they would approve and even that was that at, took a lot to, at the time at the time it so took, right well based I, on what the information we had at the time correct yeah. and so that's right and that's what I'm expressing is that and you're right John it was the MSBA but now more recently this information that's recently been provided to all of us including you has not been communicated yet to the ESBC so at their meeting on Tuesday uh, I think it was Monday. night which was also Monday. turf field and out we all we were only there for part of it but is my understanding that there was some discussion that was just beginning that I wanted to raise tonight um, that we feel very strongly Lauren's already a hundred above where we were left that's now right. now we're another year out before and the projections from NASDAQ are saying ongoing growth for K to five um, over the next three years um, uh, 79 students over the next three years and that's not in, that's above and beyond the 478 that she's talking about so um, we understand that's not only in your building but we do feel that it's very important right now that we educate the community that we meet follow up with the ESBC to really make sure that this is clearly communicated because this is new information for all of us and then that we follow up with the um, the building project manager and under his direction and guidance um, how to work with the MSBC um, and to see whether or not there is um, MSBA to see if there is additional opportunity for conversation there um, so I guess just to just to get it out there tonight we are aware that there's a disconnect between what we thought we would be and where we are um, and and we want to make sure that we um, are well prepared and that we do whatever we can do um, to address these concerns proactively. So we have 11 classrooms in the new facility? Yes. No, oh, 22. 22. Oh, 22. 11 in each grade. Maybe see if we can't stretch Plus that the over the next year or two as we get this thing going. Okay, I get it. But it seems to me, if I remember correctly, that 19 and 20 was kind of high for these. We're happy with 18 to 20. Yeah, and I think that's where some of mine were anyway. Mm -hmm. That's why 22 kind of jumped out at me. I mean, oh, she's at 24. I know. Right now we have um, we have five classes at 23 and two at 24. That's just so it not, is. It is very high. I it's agree not with recommended you. Yeah. for that age for sure, and and we're concerned about it. So I think that the important thing is that this is new information that we really haven't had. It's quite different information to be. We've talked for three years about how overall although we might see spikes in certain grade levels overall we're going to be flat as a district and now all of a sudden we're oh no you're going to be growing by 350 over the next 10 years um, and that's today's projection so again we, we we deal with the information as it's provided and we were basing our our work and our decisions from the best information that we had um, at the time well and I mean of course like Although we're talking about it from the new school perspective, these kids are going to go seemingly through the system. So yeah. those numbers will impact each school building as those grade levels. As more keep coming in. Yeah. Yes, that, and, and again, yes, that's, it's, it's showing quite a different picture than it was even last year. And so, John, you're right. I mean, when we went to the MSBA and we fortunately got the, the, that additional two classrooms, um, they had their formula and we had our formula. And I got a little heated in the room, but <laughs> we, we <laughs> maintained our course. Mm -hmm. we did. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right. 
Thank you, Mrs. Okay. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you, Mrs. DeFoe. At this time, Mrs. Carter. Um, this is Mrs. Carter and um, Aiden. Mm -hmm. Aiden, come on up. <laughs> I'm a reluctant partner. <laughs> <laughs> Has everybody in the school committee met Mr. McCann? No. Oh, this is Hi. Mr. Aiden McCann, who's our new assistant Hi. principal this year. Welcome. And we're, we're thrilled to have him with us. He's been a spectacular addition to Elmwood School. He, it feels like he's always been there. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful transition for me to have him with us. So I'm happy that he's here tonight. Um, the, some of the things that I pointed out in my overall summary for all of you is that we are expecting a decrease of 14 students um, based on NESDAQ predictions for next year um, in the second grade. So that will give us a total of 236. But in grade three, we will, um, we're expecting an increase of 24 students, which will bring us to 263. So overall, that's 10 more than where we're at now. Um, so our expectation is that we'll have 11 grade two classrooms next year, and that will be a decrease of one. Um, the the student the, it'll be about 21.5 students per class in grade two, um, but we plan on having a, an increase of one third grade classroom, so we'll have 12 third grade classrooms next year, and that's an average of 21.9. So we're we're a little bit above um, where we would hope to be too, but but we can make that work. Um, if you looked further down in my summary, we're not requesting any. Uh, personnel will have some retirements and things that will replace those personnel but we're not looking for any new um, folks for the fall of next year we are we like Lauren and and as she's already indicated we've had some nice um, additions to our staff we have a BCABA we've got a literacy coach this year that we share with Elmwood School and so last year we talked a little bit about how how nice it would be if we had a, a personnel a, a person that was at Elmwood School and was able to provide professional development, um, model for students in classrooms or for teachers, um, to conduct professional development, and also to make a connection between center school. And I think that that was something that we felt was really um, a, a big need for us. And now that we have a person that goes between the two schools, we can see how really nice it is to have a person that's saying, well, over at center school, this is what's happening in the kindergarten, this is what's happening in the first grade. It, it, we can see it's easier for us to make a nice transition and piggyback on some of the great things they're doing. They have a better sense of our needs. Um, and so that's been a really nice um, addition, and we appreciate being able to do that. Um, our BCABA is part of our what we call our social-emotional learning team, and she's been able to help us make plans um, to address the social-emotional needs of our students, and that's been nice. Uh, my a overall expense summary will might look a little bit um, concerning in some places. It, it, we made some changes so that Elmwood School can be consistent with the other schools in their budgets, and so there are some lines that may appear to be zero, or and that doesn't mean that we're not um, we're not funding or seeking materials or supplies. Um, it, you know, you'll see the appearance that we're not adding to uh, instructional materials, but we would like to. Um, and the only big change, um, overall, we are reducing our um, budget by 8795 What we did, what I was able to do with Mr. McCann this year is last year when I was sitting at this table, I really did not have a strong understanding of how this budget comes together and, and how we um, get to where we're, we're at. So what I did this year is met with each person that was requesting money of any kind, anybody who was the art department, the music department, anybody that had a, a request to make, rather than them just saying, I'd like you know, $5,000 for materials. We sat down and talked about what do you need. I don't want the dollar amount. I want the, the supplies you're looking for, the reason that you need more. And we were able to sort of tweak some things. Yeah, I can see that that's something you would need to have, but let's talk about this. Could we 
could we use this or that so that that was very helpful to me and was it, it provided a, de a slight decrease as Lauren has already talked about with our foundations program we'll continue to need s a small amount of money to purchase consumables but um, we have the materials overall that we need the the one item that I'm hoping that we will be able to fund increased supplies of materials for is um, in the areas of science and technology to to support the new um, mass science and technology curriculum so I'm hoping to be able to purchase some materials that will supplement that we'll continue to use foundations we've been very pleased this year with um, the student progress in that area um, we saw some nice gains um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the data that was provided but we saw a five percent increase in our ELA in the um, proficient and advanced category and a three percent in math we increase in our MCAS scores so uh, we attribute some of that to SRSD and the work that we've had with consultants and and being able to take the things that are starting at Center School Lauren's using that as well uh, using it in our building and then that's moving to Hopkins too so I, I think that there, we have a common understanding of what kids should be doing with their curriculum we're using the same tools language materials um, and, and I think that that's part of the reason that we've seen that success and that's it questions I just have more of a comment I, I think and I, I should have made it at Center School too I think you know I feel like what I'm seeing this year is really in line with obviously the strategic plan but we had some um, some more expensive uh, uh, or more significant programmatic changes in the first couple of years and now I think I'm feeling like from all departments what I'm or so you know based on what I read I'm really seeing the results of that in addition to a continued effort to really you know break down every single item and do you really need this or just you know just because that's what you have last year doesn't mean that's what you need for next year so it's really not a question uh, just a statement that I think um, this is what we should all have expected based on the strategic plan but sometimes things changed over the course of five years and so I'm really just pleased to see that this is sort of as predicted I think the timing happens to be very good because this is a challenging more challenging year for the town than some other years um, have been and so that's fortuitous um, that that there isn't a dramatic need so far <laughs> that we've encountered for any of our buildings because obviously this is the priority uh, is what happened is happening in the classroom other than the science which we know we've been expecting for a while and is really not our choice so um, that's all I just just to comment that I, I really applaud all of you I think mm -hmm. we're really sticking to what we said we were going to do um, when we started out on this journey a few years ago and um, I think that helps everybody to stay predictable and so thank you that's it you're welcome comment and a question I, just to build on what mrs birchman said also a lot of those significant investments over the past few years have been at the the earliest elementary schools right and so i think one of the things we've talked about in some of our joint meetings with other committees have been we're investing but we're not going to keep coming back for these increases every year and you're starting to see the results you know up on the screen and then we are starting to level off on those requests so i think that that just shows that that the the investment that the town supported is both paying off and we're not just going back to the well for the sake of it we're, we're being very smart about that so um just a quick technical budget question the fifty seven thousand dollars that you mentioned about this science so that's not in here oh, right well the, it's within that within the 57 is it that is that, is that, is that, is that, is that in Elm, that's in elmwood mm -hmm. it's yeah, included in it supply. Yes, see that. Right. I thought it, was it might be under science textbooks and materials. Okay. No, it actually wasn't. That's what I was going to ask a question about because it all seems to be falling under general supply. Everything. Yeah. So for me, I can see. Oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. So that's that the entirety of your general supply. Right. But okay. if you see yeah. the increase from last year, it's twenty-two thousand dollars. So that's, that's okay. Design. Well, it's consumables were, were put for the foundations were put in a different line. So we took out of the text that you know the text ELA textbook says zero, I think. Yeah. But the consumables were put into materials instead. Uh, but in the past, I think at Elmwood's budget, we had line items where other schools had things condensed. And so it, it looks a little different this year than my budget did last year. 
There's about $7,500 of science techs and supplies that's included in the 57912 yeah, and I see and I see what you're saying because I just flipped back up to the center school budget. It looks like center school has had started doing the same thing previously, mm -hmm. condensing it down to the general. So I think I was an outlier. The individual line items mine. for the yeah. for the budgets. Probably if we're going to do that as a practice, we should adjust the sheet, right? Yeah, going if forward. We're, if we're never going to put would. anything in those, yeah. no, it's for your successor. <laughs> yep, absolutely. You're going to have to start bringing the clock with it's you. It's going to be meeting. part of the transition. <laughs> Kelly, did you have any comments? No, they've been covered. Thanks. Um, I had one question, and it's probably more for Mr. Dumas. So, with there not being any staffing changes in the increase of ninety-eight thousand on the, the teachers, is that all steps and lanes? I mean, I guess with retirements, I would have expected it to be going down. Well, uh, actually, there are two retirements, one and a half FTEs, mm -hmm. at at that school, uh, but um, all of the other remaining staff gets a two and a half percent raise plus several of them get steps and several of them are projecting to get lane changes gotcha. if figured, not I figure that was the yeah, answer it's yeah fair. if not for the retirements obviously that number would have been much higher right right okay um, mr. her mr. Kamal All set. no questions uh, I like the fact that everybody knows where the pennies are, so. Sure. Mr. Banning. Oh, no questions. Well, <laughs> thank you. Less, less pain you. for you this year, That's Mrs. Right. Carver. It sure is. <laughs> You're saving it for Thank you very thank much. Thank you. This is Bolello. How are you? And I don't think I've... Madison. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting your assistant. For no. So um, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing you all to Miss Julie Babson. We now have two Miss, Miss B's mm -hmm. at Hopkins School, which gets confusing for children. I'm often Miss Babson, and she's often, often Mrs. Bolello. But I guess that's because we both run around and do a lot of different things, wear a lot of different hats at the school. Um, it's been a wonderful start to the school year, and it's, it's great having Miss Babson um, alongside me as my partner to go through this journey and um, we do have some changes at Hopkins this year we have a, a, a significant um, enrollment projection increase next year of 29 students and um, to me the most important piece was to maintain class sizes that allow us to maintain our workshop model in math and reading. We feel that's the best way to educate students at this age level and make sure that we meet, provide the differentiation that they really do need um, at fourth and fifth grade. So our biggest priority was to maintain close to the same class sizes that we have now. So with the 29 student projected increase, that means that overall in our school we're asking for an additional section. We're at 22 sections this year. Next year we would be at 23, 11 in fourth grade and 12 sections at fifth grade with 279 students. So our class size will be a little above 23 at grade five and a little above 22 at grade four. Um, so that's our overall class size. That was my first priority. And so that's where that request for an additional classroom teacher comes from. Can I ask one quick question? I'm sure. Because I, I, I haven't experienced Hopkins yet. That'll be next year. Yeah. Um, is the section a class? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Just the vernacular. That's all I was. Sure. So we have um, 12 classrooms at fifth grade and 11. Right. Currently, we have 10 sections or 10 fifth grade classrooms. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Um, the other piece here that um, I don't know, it's not necessarily translated into my budget per se, but a piece that looking at balancing that, having had a lot of opportunity to work with special education department, Dr. Zaleski, uh, Beth Callahan, our team chair, who also is at Elmwood, and understanding the needs of the district across the entire district, one of the uh, pieces that I came back to Dr. McLeod and Dr. Zaleski with was the idea that looking at our numbers, which are going to maintain the, st the same numbers about probably projected in special education, but looking at uh, lowering our moderate learning specialist numbers down to seven. Now, you might be looking at me and saying, you're a special education teacher by trade, and you know why would you want to decrease that? I think one of the things that 
Dr. McLeod, Dr. Zaleski, and I have really explored is the idea of being more creative with our co-teaching model. We feel that we can do more with the specialists that we have, and um, I believe that for the, the needs of the district, when we look at case size um, for learning specialists, that we can be creative with our co-teaching model. We know that the middle school has a successful co-teaching model. We know Elmwood does. Um, I have experience in other districts with co-teaching, and I've already started the conversations with my special education department about exploring, now that we've lived co-teaching in really its purest form, how can we modify that a little bit to be a little more economically sound for the district? Um, so I am suggesting that we go down to seven moderate learning specialists. It will change that model a little bit, and I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation at our building about how we make that work. But I was going to put that out there to help balance our need for an additional section or classroom. Um, the other piece that I am requesting is a 0.1 increase in our general music teacher. Um, we had our music concert last night. I played a little bit of saxophone with our band. Um, I have to say I think it is fantastic that this town supports the music the way it does at elementary school. It is not typical anymore. And what I'm asking for with this increase to 0.9 from 0.8 FTE of our general music teacher allows us to maintain the program we currently have. That um, program includes the general music related arts class, um, our fifth grade elective chorus block, and a fourth grade trimester chorus so that they try it out. Um, this is what we have right now with that increased section and scheduling requirements. We would have to lose something without that point one increase. Um, and that's where it comes from. I am suggesting a decrease in our overall supply budget. This uh, committee has been wonderful supporting technology in the district, and that technology has benefited Hopkins School greatly. Our teachers are utilizing Chromebooks on a regular basis. Our students are using Google Classroom to prepare them for the middle school one-to-one -one setting. And because of that, the amount of time they're using the technology, a lot of things we used to do, paper, pencil tasks, with um, notebooks, readers' notebooks, where now our teachers have found ways to explore and integrate technology into that. So a lot of my decrease in my budget is going to come from decreased needs in paper products. The increases that I really see us needing also go to science. And I know Dr. Kavanaugh has presented about the overall science curriculum. But thinking about our Massachusetts science standards that I've spent a lot of time looking at with teachers this fall. It's so inquiry-based, and that means more labs, more experimentation. We've been utilizing our lab this fall, um, our new science lab space at Hopkins School, mm -hmm. and labs mean more supplies. And so that needs to come out of my budget. So I definitely have an increase to provide more lab inquiry-based experiments, and then hopefully we will get the curriculum to, to go with that. Um, those are the big budget drivers at Hopkins this year. Do you have any questions? All right, let's start again. Um, thank you. I actually, I have, a, I have a, sm a question about a small budget driver, but I, um, I wanted to just circle back with you. One of the last times we saw you, you had a very creative approach to how you could add some time for the kids for recess, mm -hmm. changing up lunch a little bit, involving a lunch monitor, which I see is in here for a very modest amount of money. And I just, um, I'm not sure people are aware of all of the work that you did um, to go, you know, that went into it. And I certainly am not worried about this amount of money, but I was just curious if you could tell us sort of how that was going and the difference that that is making for the kids um, it's on a regular basis. Absolutely. So it's been several pronged approach. One thing we did was we decreased our secretarial support in the office, which is only possible when you have amazing secretaries. Um, Kim Picard and Kathy Reynolds do an amazing job. They're very efficient. So we were able to cut that. And with the additional money, um, Ms. Babson actually helped hire a lunch monitor who has helped facilitate and um, 
I've given the ideas and Ms. Babson has run with it and we have a very successful mileage club that now will be running through the winter and a lot of students involved in that along with some other opportunities both during our lunch time supported by that lunch monitor um, and we have kept the additional 20 minute recess separate from our lunch block there's still challenges related to that but the offset increased movement time for students in fourth fifth grade we feel is really beneficial for the students so that's been great to see awesome thank you no, thank you. Oh. So the the net save that you're looking at for the learning specialist? It doesn't come from my budget. Right. That would be okay. out of the special. So, that comes at, so is that in the SPED budget we saw? Yes, it is. Okay, so that's not an adjustment to, right. to that existing My budget, budget. is okay. still higher because I just have the... Okay. Um, so that was, that was my only just logistical question to confirm that. And then <laughs> just a comment because you talked about in the supplies all the paper reduction. I long for the day for probably both you and the budget following you we get to the point where we don't have to have the kids carrying those gigantic cases anymore Absolutely. so I really support the move away from <laughs> mr. Ghosh and I are collaborating on that as we speak <laughs> we're colluding and <laughs> collaborating to talk about that because a large part of that also comes from um, professional development for the teachers we've sent a lot of teachers to various Google summits and to learn more about how to integrate because they need to be able to do that in order to teach it. And certainly at Hopkins School, we feel first and foremost, digital liter literacy, digital citizenship are key. So we need to teach them to use that technology safely and appropriately, both as a textbook tool, as a word processing tool, as a research tool, but then also to be interacting with their teachers and their peers. And that really sets them up for that environment that the middle school provides them. So we feel that that's one of the biggest responsibilities we have at fourth and fifth grade. Mm -hmm. and, and look forward to continuing that. Great. Brings us back to the SML. I mean, I think yes. that's a good connection to what we were talking about at the beginning of the meeting. So no questions, just a comment. I, I really did appreciate seeing that you've already thought through things that could use alternate funding. So oh. it was nice to see that in there. And we, um, it does look like our Miss Barkin, who is the uh, general music teacher, working with the HPTA, we are going to be using some of that gift fund to get a um, electric piano, which yeah. is huge. Chassis. So those kinds of things have already were, were in really process, cool. and given some of the technical problems we had last night at the music concert, <laughs> will be a welcome addition <laughs> to the music department. I think. I didn't have anything additional. So, um, Mr. Herr or Mr. Kamala, did you have any questions or comments? The library librarian salary budget looks like it's down. It's a, it's a, we have the same librarian as Elmwood, so it's a 0.5 position at each school, and she is um, retired. She's announced her retirement. So, with her leaving and a new person coming in, that that's the reduction in both Elmwood and my. Salary for a retirement. Salary is less than the current library. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Kamala, anything? Okay. Mr. Anning? No, everything's very clear. Right. Thank you. Before we move on and before you get to leave the hot seat, if we could just draw the school committee's attention and, and, uh, and our honored guests to um, this data. The school committee felt it was really important, and, and we concur, that we connect the achievement uh, presentation that we give to the budget presentation and so Dr. Kavanaugh sure so I didn't point this out when Ann was making her presentation but I will say that at the Elmwood school we got the very best MCAS scores we've had in the history of Elmwood school and if we take a look at that yes that is very exciting oh Hopkins or you wanted to go back to Elmwood and then no, we can oh. talk about Hopkins now. okay um, <laughs> Hopkins Easy. also has their best overall scores in the past four years but one of the things that Vanessa was just talking about is sort of being a special educator by trade. And I think that that's a strength that she brings to the Hopkins School. So I was looking at their trends and accountability data over the past three years. And so if we take a look at that slide, you can see that in 2014, the high needs percentage was at 40, and it really needed to get to 75. And then in 2015, the high needs percentage made it to 50 and in 2016 the high needs percentage 
uh, made it to 61, and the special education students with disabilities made it to 62. So just to give you a slide where you can see all of those numbers together, um, high needs has gone from 40 to 50 to 61, and students with disabilities has gone from 34 to 54 to 62. So really those numbers are going up, and I think in very large increments at Hopkins. Um, so I think what we're doing with our students with um, special needs and students um, that are considered to be high needs, so that's the L population, economically disadvantaged students and students on um, education plans. Um, those, that, that kind of growth is incredible, what's going on there right now. And we would see the same kind of thing if we went back and looked at some of that Elmwood data, so. I would agree, The um, and I think that's a combination of things that um, Lauren and Ann already spoke to, the resources, the level literacy intervention program that we've implemented now fully, um, at Hopkins School has been wonderful to the but also we have had an increase over several years in our special education teachers and that has allowed that co-teaching model which I spoke about being integral to implementing the changes so a combination of both intervention changes that we made providing specially designed instruction but then also linking that with skilled per, um, teachers to implement it have been really instrumental thank you very much thank you thank you all right at this time mr keller so i think that mr uh, bishop and mr keller one of these times has to petition to reverse the order of the school <laughs> since they're all the last ones in the hot seat even though all the principals are here supporting each other which you can't see on tv but i do you start the early I do feel for our. Oh, uh, they voted for this. He, he <laughs> voted were, for this. He were. actually spoke up. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. He spoke up. I it didn't say. It is true. Him. Sorry, <laughs> but um, we did give them the <laughs> option of reversing it, and it's true that Mr. Bishop did speak up loud and yes. clear, and Mr. Keller just kind of went along, I guess. <laughs> they just think that the first three will wear us out, so we won't. <laughs> that actually, that actually wasn't no thinking. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Keller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad plan. <laughs> Um, well, well, thank you. So I, um, in, in terms of planning uh, the budget for uh, FY18, um, you can see uh, in the um, executive summary that I prepared for you, uh, our projected enrollment is down 72 students for next year. So we are projecting at 800 students for next year. Um, and uh, the budget that I prepared, um, I'll talk obviously about personnel and talk about supplies and expenses. I did want to talk a little bit about how this budget touches on um, strategic uh, plan initiatives and priority initiatives. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh was doing with the other schools, I'm particularly uh, proud, although it's one measure, the MCAS, um, I'm proud of the um, accomplishments that we made um, in the past year. And so we've been working uh, extensively on uh, essential standards in all classes and making sure that our um, each class that we have is focused on what all students must accomplish uh, in that in a unit in that in that um, course for the entire year and that's been important work for the past couple of years and we've also been working extensively on co-teaching uh, and really bridging the gap between our special educators and our um, general education uh, teachers and so that's been a big part is making sure that there's collaboration happening and, and Lauren um, excuse me Vanessa had talked about um, co-teaching uh, Lauren didn't know that I was a principal um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, and so in terms of that collaboration in terms of working on our essential standards um, one of the things that we've that I've been talking to all of you about and uh, over the years is RTI and working really hard um, to support our students um, on IEPs um, students who may struggle with content, but we've also really been trying to focus extensively on students who come in on the first day of, of a unit and already know the content. And so um, some of the things that I wanted to highlight in, in the data were um, our work with um, some of the, um, or our improvements, our gains in, in the advanced category for the MCAS achievement level. And so we actually, in all grade levels, in English and math, uh, with the one exception, uh, we showed uh, growth in the number of students achieving advanced and uh, and that happened in um, in grade eight math uh, we had it happened at all all except one and we had substantial gains in grade seven English and grade eight uh, math and so I'm, I'm proud of the work that those teachers have been doing both general and special education teachers uh, as well as the, the, the entire faculty Dr. Kavanaugh did you want to <laughs> 
Say that louder. <laughs> oh, well, no, I wasn't, I wasn't calling you out. I just didn't know if there was anything that I missed no, that you wanted we to. We were just simply saying over here that 63% advance at the middle school level is, is pretty impressive, really. Yeah. Um, and then the only other um, new piece of data that I hadn't shared with you before, uh, when the fall rolls around, DESE will send out report cards for every school. And one of the things that we have learned about Hopkinton Middle School is that it ranks in the 97th percentile, which means that Hopkinton Middle School is doing better than 97, 96% of the middle schools across Massachusetts. So that is a number to be very proud of. So I think so, I, I firmly believe that a lot of um, our successes have come from the work the teachers are doing, uh, obviously with their students, but also when uh, they're meeting together. And, and that's part of our professional learning communities that as a district um, we've been working on. And so uh, some of what you'll hear tonight is about improving professional learning communities. So I'll start with my personnel summary. Um, so the first item on here is to increase a 1.0 guidance counselor. Um, and so this actually um, is currently in, in place right now. We received a grant in the summer uh, from the Metro West Community Health Care Foundation. Uh, it's our start program, and it's a transition program for students who are returning to school from an absence, from an illness. Uh, the high school, I believe, began two years ago. Or this is your second year? Uh, and so we applied for the same grant uh, last year and received it. So this is actually a grant-funded position for FY18, um, but I want to reflect that. Um, the next item on here is a reduction of 2.0 FTE uh, core teachers. Um, these teachers um, started in the FY15 budget uh, as uh, 2.0 dual certified teachers. We had a very large class, their eighth grade now. It's uh, actually at 311. And so as a way to address the, the uh, class size, we brought in two dual certified. And they were part of a mini team for several years. And this last year in eighth grade, they were incorporated into uh, now a mega team. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, we do not no longer have the need for, uh, for those teachers. And so that is a 2.0 reduction. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm requesting a 1.8 FTE increase in foreign language teachers. And so uh, 1.6 of that is for the teaching of French and Spanish in grades 7 and 8. Uh, and this is um, one of the things that our foreign language teachers have been charged to do over the past. Um, actually, this is their first year working really on a proficiency-based model where the emphasis and the focus is really on having students be able to speak the language, having them be able to um, hear the language and understand the language. And so it's really focused on if you're placed in a foreign country, will you be able to succeed in that foreign country? And a lot of the emphasis in the past has mo been more on the grammar and, and the writing. And so that still is present, but it's a lot more based on, on the, the um, ability to communicate uh, orally. And so, um, so at present, um, the foreign language teachers have a load of 125 students when compared to 88, approximately 88 students for the rest of um, for the academic teachers. And, um, and I'm requesting that additional 1.6 to French and Spanish to help uh, even that load out. Um, they're doing extensive assessments of, with students. Um, they're asking them to speak frequently as homework assignments and then going over those things. So it's uh, that's become a bit of a, a cumbersome load for them. Um, and then we, um, um, the other point two of that 1.8 uh, is a request to add Mandarin Chinese at grade seven for next year. Um, the high school has had Mandarin Chinese beginning in the 2010-2011 school year. And um, we believe that um, beginning Mandarin Chinese at grade nine is essentially doing a disservice to that language and, and those students are a disadvantage because they're not reaching proficiency levels. So uh, beginning Mandarin Chinese at grade seven, like French and Spanish, uh, we'll, we'll put that on the same par as, as a, an opportunity for student proficiency. So it's a point two FTE, Mandarin Chinese. We believe that we would have one section, one class of uh, Mandarin Chinese at grade seven for next year. And then the final increase in terms of personnel is for a point two FTE orchestra teacher. Uh, that program has uh, considerable growth. Uh, in um, FY15, we had eight grade eight students in the program. And this year, as an example, in grade eight, we have 31 students enrolled in orchestra. So we're excited about the growth and feel as though we need to address um, that, that number of students. Um, and then on to expenses. Um, we have 27 supply and textbooks accounts. 19 of them are at or below the FY17 budget. Um, and then um, three of those uh, eight are um, 
are below 500, and then I have five that are above 500. And I actually uh, misspoke in uh, in that. Uh, so I have five that are above 500, not below 500. So um, they are ELA, ELA. So in the ELA textbook account, we need to we brought in a new vocabulary program four years ago, and those paperback vocabulary books have many of them have seen better days. So we need to replace those. And we're also looking to bring in literacy circles uh, at each grade level to help differentiate uh, with some of the novels that we do. Um, another increase is in our math textbook account. Um, we, uh, several years ago, 10 Marks is, a, is an Amazon company, and they uh, offer it to schools free summer, um, uh, summer accounts for schools, and we gave those to students, and we received really positive feedback from parents uh, and from students, surprisingly. And, uh, and so um, it's now, it's no longer free, and, um, but we are attempting to build up our summer math program, much like our summer reading program. Um, and the thing about 10 Marks is it's, um, students are, are doing math, but it's, it's not labor intensive. It's, it's, it's a lot more, uh, it's somewhat fun uh, to do some of the math. And so we're looking to provide accounts to all of our students um, to do summer math. And so that's that increase. Uh, our music, our, cor our honors course program is in need of some new materials. And so we have an increase to the music textbook account in the amount of $700. And we have an increase for physical education supplies uh, by $500 for materials for new activities that they're looking to introduce to the curriculum. And the final and largest one, obviously, is an increase to the science supply account. And so, um, as I believe you know, we have new Massachusetts science and technology engineering standards. And so we're looking to, obviously, bring in uh, materials to address those standards that were no, weren't previously in our curriculum and things that the teachers weren't previously using. Um, first of all, congratulations, because this has been an effort over as many years as I've been sitting here. So obviously, it's to the credit of all of the principals that come before you. Yes. Even though you are actually a principal here <laughs> and do impact it. So, but just congratulations. That's a, a, it's amazing news. That's something that we've all been working toward for a long time. Um, and I just, I. When I read through this, I was confused about the adjustment counselor only because it's on the personnel. This is just a public service announcement. It's on the personnel request, but the offset must be in the grant funding. Yes, sir, so sir. even though it says $63,000, we're not actually adding that to the budget. But I d it did lead me to a question, which is that, um, is that something that after your grant runs out, you anticipate maintaining? Is it something that's providing benefit um, yeah I mean so if successful so we're only um, you know three months um, three months in but we've definitely to this point seen seen tremendous benefit we're we're servicing um, many students that we feel like otherwise probably wouldn't be coming to school um, and so that's I mean that uh, that's my hope is that this will prove successful and we will then be uh, at this table saying we want to bring this into the budget okay well that's great so that's just kind of a heads up to us and then the other thing is I just think you know <coughs> finally you have the room and we have the resources and so at, starting with the Mandarin in seventh grade is something that again we've been talking about as long as I've been sitting here and I just I'm so, so thrilled that we're finally at the point of being able to do that and I assume that that means that next year we're gonna see a request for an eighth grade Correct. right yeah. so that um, yeah, no, I just think that's great. So I have no questions. Just thank you. Thank you. It's not fair. You go first. You always take my comments. <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing about the right mirror. Congratulations. Hold on. <laughs> Mr. Raziano. Um, I guess my, so, so I, I like the Mandarin expansion um, and obviously the, the caseload expansion for the foreign language teachers. Um, I guess th this is the first year in a while, and I don't know, I apologize, I don't know why this didn't occur to me until I'm sitting here. Um, this is the first year in a while we haven't talked about sixth grade. For foreign um, language? For foreign language. Yeah. Um, now, we obviously haven't even actually put it in for sixth grade, but um, I'm just curious if there are any thoughts around that since we are adding additional, I know the additional resources are designed to reduce caseload in seventh and eighth grade, yeah. but is there any continued thought around sixth grade, or are we steering away from that? Are you both looking at me? Because I'm happy to answer. <laughs> uh, I, that was, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy Usually to answer. Usually my questions go to Mr. Numis, so this one's different. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to take it. No, that'd be okay. <laughs> um, so I, I, I feel that we gave an extensive look at this question last year. Okay. 
um, and that the conclusion at the end of that study was that um, for now anyway science had to be the priority um, that we couldn't do around specials around cost around increases um, before we would be able to expand the foreign language program and then I think what was most important to me was that we can get kids to proficiency that we currently in our current co course offerings if I didn't feel that we could that would be a different consideration but I was very assured having gone through the process last year and, and put extensive time into it um, that our, our current course offerings and this just e adds even more opportunity for students to have a variety of experiences students can get to level six or whatever the, the six years or the, what's the level I think four I can't remember but there's a level that Marilyn was talking about that we want our kids to be able to achieve in order to be proficient in a second language and our current offerings get them there so I did not um, give I felt that we had for the time being being agreed that we weren't going to be looking at that um, until we had science up and running and and then you know based on where we are with the budget would be happy to take another look at it okay I'm mean, gonna yeah. answer yeah okay. especially the proficiency piece so right. I won't ask next year I promise <laughs> That's right. It's okay. Well, and I'll just add something to the proficiency piece. Um, the world language people are considering implementing, I think in 2019, a seal of biliteracy that would actually go on a student's diploma, indicating whether or not that student had made it to a particular level of proficiency. So that will be one of those things that becomes rather prestigious, I think, for kids in foreign language in a couple nice. of years. Yeah. Okay. And so we'll be reminded that at that level in grade 11 and 12, th those are electives. That if students want that seal, they certainly have the ability to get it because we have enough classes that they could take that would get them there. So I think that those things are all important considerations. Um, the point two, is that an existing person? Is like the Mandarin teacher at the high school adding point two and coming down to the middle school? I mean, we have some of those conversations about the possibility of it and uh, Mr. Bishop and uh, his, his assistants and my uh, assistants have talked extensively about schedule and the possibilities of that um, so right now it's a point two but um, that w that potentially is something that um, we that's something we've talked about and it could be it could be a possibility I just wondered if is it hard to find somebody to come for a point two position yeah it may be I mean we had so this past year we hired a point four uh, language teacher somebody that um, still wants to be home with um, you know with her children but this was an opportunity so I, I it may be difficult but um, I, my understanding of talking to Miss Miracle and uh, is that there certainly are um, people out there that are interested in, in part-time work um, that, that could be able to do that but it would be it would be wonderful if uh, if it could work out with high school to, to be able to share staff if ultimately if approved. That's the only thing I have. Thanks. I didn't actually have anything additional. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. Very clear to me. Um, I did want to give our uh, other guests the opportunity. Mr. Manning, I apparently I'm always starting with the Rebel wrong person on the side, so I'm going to start over here with you. And yeah, I do have a question. I sure. The push to start earlier in the foreign language, but I am curious. Um, just statistically, you have, four, you have to for four years in high school. What percentage take foreign language in their junior year and what take it in their fourth year to take advantage? You're starting earlier, but are the students actually going the full four years, or are the majority stopped after their junior year because you believe three years is required? Do you have that, yeah, Mr. Bishop? In the last few years, the students taking all four years of foreign language. Uh, I, I don't have the exact percentage for you right now, uh, but there's certainly been an increase uh, over the last. Uh, oh, okay. I can tell you, we, we typically ran one section, say, of AP Spanish for four or five years, and now we're running two and three sections the last few years, and the same with French as well. So, okay. My my reasoning for the question was, if you're starting earlier, and if they don't go the four mm -hmm. years, you're just shifting it earlier and not getting the maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to follow through. Mm -hmm. mm. Mr. Kamala. <laughs> My goodness, tonight you are very quiet. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Mr. Herr? So please don't read into my questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the $63,000 offset, is that this grant money? 
Yeah. Yes. In 2000 there, 223, I assume that's contractual obligations, primary steps and lanes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the final Yes, it is. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, then the guidance salary, that's the increase, put the offsets down below. Yeah. And then are the librarian, assistant principal, and principal um, good numbers, but are those contractual obligations or are those merit increase type deals? Both. You direct or? Um, so in this case, um, there was merit involved in negotiating a successor agreement um, for the principal. Got it. Okay. And then is the librarian in the, in the teacher's union or is that? Union. What ca I don't know what the question is about the librarian. Oh. The it's a teacher's union. It's HTA. Yeah. So it hers is. That line and not down below. That's correct because it's not a classroom teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Before you end with him, I have one comment. Okay. Did it, everyone else? Okay. Great. I just want to point out to everybody because Alan went into a great. Um, you know details and explanation about expenses and the the areas where um, he's looking for increases but in the first round of reductions before we even came here he already reduced his supplies by thirteen thousand thirteen thousand six hundred eighteen dollars and so as I was listening to you go through I knew that you had made some difficult decisions around other requests that you're not even seeing mm -hmm. here so the things that remain tonight are things that we agreed could absolutely not not be reduced any further so I just wanted to I was kind of listening and thinking well wait a minute you know I know that you there were things when you talked about the five areas where you're asking for more there were more than those and you had to make some difficult decisions yeah so just a reminder that was I all. mean I guess what I would reiterate is that I mean I know mr. Bishop will likely have a similar story but all the principals tonight have very much demonstrated the want versus needs that we were looking for and I really greatly appreciate it and obviously I'm sure that our town officials do as well as like we're all being very mindful of the spend so thank you very much for your efforts there thank it you. makes our job during this a lot easier so and as far as the um, accomplishments of the middle school what I'd like to call out while he's still sitting here is this year six I think it's seven he says it like that with a grimace <laughs> <laughs> because but but I just want to point out that that's what it takes it takes sustainability it takes it takes an administrator who sticks with a building and with what he believes in and um, the programs and and has the support of his teachers in the way that he does um, to achieve th this kind of achievement because it's not only the 97 percent it's also the um, the level one designation but it's also just the overall scores consistently across all grade levels that it's just a significant increase from as, as you know even three years ago um, so I just want to point that out while you're sitting there and I can embarrass you <laughs> thank you I'll leave now thank you, <laughs> thank you, very much. Thank you. Mr. Bishop oh. last but certainly not least <laughs> nice no, it's not. It was oh, nice. it might be mine too. Um, I do have to ask because I, I seem to have two. Do I, am I missing? Oh no, one's the athletic department. I was like, why do I have two? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is tight. Is that your elbow? Yeah, it's all right. I'll just roll with it. Are you, Mr. Bishop doing both uh, athletics? I am. And yes. High yes. Tonight? Yes. Um, well, good evening, everyone. And first off, thank you for the opportunity to talk both about the high school as well as. Uh, the athletic department budget needs for FY17. Uh, I obviously have some big shoes to fill after the last four presentations um, from Lauren and Vanessa and Alan. And uh, I do just want to take a second to just say uh, it's a real pleasure to, to work with all of you and, and learn from you. It's a very talented group. Uh, and I'm grateful to just be part of a, a district admin team that gets along with one another so well. And uh, we had a little bit of a pizza party before we came here. And it just uh, it's, it makes it enjoyable to come to work every day. So, but to answer your question at the beginning, that aside, the reason I'm last is we're saving the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with the uh, high school. Uh, I think we worked really hard to propose a fiscally responsible budget uh, with regard to our personnel increases as well as our non-payroll items such as supplies and equipment and textbooks. Uh, I've met and received feedback from SMLs both at the district level and at the high school over the last two months. Uh, and we've made some difficult yet uh, what I feel is appropriate cuts of totaling over about $80,000 from personnel increases 
goods and supplies. Uh, that were our initial proposal in October uh, from what you have in front of you here tonight to adhere to the expectation to, uh, to provide a well thought out and reasonable budget for you. So in regards to personnel, uh, we are asking for a 0.6 increase. Uh, this 0.6 FTE increase would be distributed across the history and social science as well as the world language departments. Um, uh, this increase, in my opinion, is greatly needed to allow us to keep class sizes at the current levels. As you know, the ninth grade class coming in, the class of 2021, is the largest class numbers-wise in the district. So when our class of 17 graduates and 21 enters next September, we'll be up about 40 students of enrollment. Uh, which I believe is uh, 1129 is the projected next year, and right now we're a little bit below 1100 at 1091. Uh, I do want to mention that the uh, point 0.4 or the point 0.6 increase uh, will be funded similar to this year with the increase that we've made to the F1 uh, visa account with adding more students and the revenue that we're receiving from that. And I feel the increase for the point 0.6 is directly connected to our strategic plan in, in a variety of ways, but most specifically on Section 3 and effective instruction. In regards to our expense summary, uh, each year we try to put a focus on a few areas that we really want to try to highlight and uh, make uh, needed improvements. Uh, if you remember last year, one of the areas was this library. Clearly, you liked it enough to change your meetings here this year. Um, but we've made it into a learning commons, and it's really the, the hub of the high school. Um, and the other area, if you remember, was, was kind of creating our new engineering uh, program, uh, both at the middle school and high school, which has just been a great addition uh, from our middle school robotics teams and classes to our high school program. Uh, most recently, we had students from our team robotics uh, class compete up in North Andover at a competition. And out of 43 teams, we were one of seven that made it to states in March. So really exciting. We're actually hosting as a high school our first robotics competition this weekend here in the Athletic oh. Center. Yes. So uh, again, um, you know, in my opinion, money really well spent uh, is it's going directly to the kids and it's having a major impact. So, and I say that because when you look at our expense supplies for this year, we tr try to do our best to, to level fund or decrease most of them. Uh, we have five accounts that are over $1,000. And the reason uh, I'll explain in a moment, but um, in regards to kind of the area that we're really trying to prioritize is around our athletic department this upcoming year. Now, I know that's a separate budget, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we really tried to do our best to be very fiscally responsible with our supply lines so we could um, do what we needed to do to make our athletic department uh, and make the improvements that we think we need. So I'll get to that in, in a moment. In regards to the high school non-budget uh, expense items. We have five accounts. I'll, I'll try to go through them pretty quickly that are over a thousand. The first is our world language text. Uh, upper, uh, it's about $2,900 increase. We are ex uh, expecting a projection of two additional French two classes from the large ninth grade class coming in next fall. Uh, so we need that money for online subscriptions for texts and materials to have those two classes run. We are also looking for an increase in our music uh, equipment budget. Uh, it's a one-time increase of about 6300 Two reasons. One, we're looking to buy a Barry saxophone. Right now we have four saxophones at the school. We have six, maybe seven students going to be playing instrument next year. Uh, so we would like to purchase another one uh, to have five total. And we're also seeing an increase in the amount of students that are taking chorus, which is excellent under the leadership of Mr. Hay and Mr. Brody. And so, I don't know, we have a, uh, a performance here next for our chorus and we're running out of room on our choral risers and so we need to purchase another riser for our performances. So that's for the increase in that account. We're also showing an increase in our co-curricular supply account of 10000 and that's directly related to activities associated with the international student program and the cost of these activities is offset by that increase that I mentioned before. We're also asking for an increase into our new equipment account of 3500 for two main reasons. Um, we are, again, getting more students. We need more cafeteria tables and chairs. And we also have a washer and dryer on its last legs for our athletic department when washing equipment. Uh, so we need to be able to purchase a new washer and dryer for our athletics program. And the last account that's up is the principal's professional development account. It's up about $3,000 or a little bit above that. Uh, we're putting a little bit more money in to try to get some more uh, trainings for our assistant principals as well as to fund our SML retreat. I'm not sure if you're aware of the SML retreat, but it's three days over the summer. And in my opinion, it's some of the best PD that we do all year. We get together, um, Dr. McLeod and Dr. Kavanaugh come, and, and we talk about the previous year. We look at data. We talk about instruction. We talk about curriculum. Uh, we set our goals for the year. We talk about the PD calendar. And since we started doing this, I really see and feel just a better culture of a distributed leadership model that we have at the high school that kind of permeates to all the teachers. And so it gets us off on the right foot each and every year. So that's what that increase is in there for. Now I'd like to just kind of point out some of our data up here. I know you've seen these slides before, but I want to take a minute to, to make the connection to the recent budget uh, request that we've made and that you've so graciously approved over the last few 
few years that have uh, directly um, been connected to our success, whether it be through standardized assessments or just other measures. And I kind of want to point uh, between the 2014-15 year, you see a pretty dramatic increase. Uh, that was the FY15 year, and that was the year we went to the SML model. And that's the year that we had them have the expert teachers have reduced time, which you would think, well, if you take them out of the classroom, why are the score so high? But they are now coaches of our teachers, and they're giving feedback, uh, and they're aligning the curriculum 9 through 12. And I think that adjustment has paid major dividends in terms of our scores. It also allowed us to get some FTE, and if you go to the next slide, Dr. Kavanaugh, um, not as significant of an increase, but again, an increase from 14 to 15. Um, and if you go one more to our science uh, budget as well, uh, same idea. The, it goes from... 66 to, I think it's, I can't really see from this point, but again, it's, a, it's an increase, and um, it's, it's a little bit more in ELA, but we're seeing increases across the board, and we're adding FTE the last few years uh, to our English, math, and science uh, classrooms, and so that has helped us keep class sizes manageable, uh, and it's also allowed us to create common planning periods for our teachers, so they can look at assessment results, they can make adjustments to their practice, which we talk about a lot of the district, so I just wanted to kind of make that connection that some of the things that we have done in small increments over the last three or four years have really um, you know, paid dividends when it comes to some of our data. So if you go to the next slide, Dr. Kavanaugh. Thank you. It's our, uh, you guys have seen this uh, slide from the other schools, and, and we're excited that our, our high needs number, we met that. So if you see the students with disabilities, the TARDIS 75, and our high needs is at 76, which makes us a level one school. Uh, so kudos to the work of our special education department. Um, because we've added some FTE in some of those subjects, we've also been able to create what we call uh, foundational classes uh, in English, math, and science. We've offered a remediation for some of our most struggling students and really targeted some of the instruction. And so when you take that all together, I think that's uh, some of the increases that we're seeing here. I don't know if you'd like to add anything, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh. But um, you know, I think that it's the interventions that we're providing and the proper supports uh, because I feel like we're staffed appropriately at this point. I do have another bit of data that I did not uh, give to you in time. I'm, I apologize. I just wanted to, to make this uh, make this statement about our special education students. Um, so I, I, we, we took a little bit uh, of a look at our um, continuing uh, education after high school and where they're going and if they're going to college and what the percentage is. And in 2014, 75% of students that were seniors uh, on IEPs went to a uh, four-year college. Uh, in 2015, 79. So there was an increase. And in this past Last year in 2016, 89% of our students uh, that were on IEPs uh, went to two or four-year colleges, which is ex exciting. So you can see that increase. And I know Dr. Zaleski, she's the only one that left, so I guess she doesn't support the high school very much. But um, <laughs> she, she's been doing an excellent job in regards to uh, her, her work with our, uh, with our teachers and our students. So I think that, that certainly shows there. Um, and this is uh, another slide about our report card. Uh, you know, I think the, the areas that jump out to me, it's, half, it's down in the middle. The advanced placement test was scores of three or higher. Our average is, it looks like 84.5, and the national average, or our state, is 66.5. That's a significant increase in, uh, or, or difference, and it uh, goes to show how talented our teachers are, but also how our, our, our talented our students are. And so, um, yeah, so that's some of, the, some of the stuff that we're talking about here at the high school. Um, I, I, I can take a breath right now before I go on to the athletic department budget and yeah, answer any questions. Yeah, because I often wonder when you're presenting to us, Mr. Bishop, if I should bring oxygen for you when you're <laughs> sorry I talk fast I apologize it's a tougher crowd than I remember it being yeah. the best yeah. year. I'm impressed he can, he's like yes. someone asked me if I could do it in six minutes over there so <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of money right yeah I know I think yeah, I lost before that before you move on to yes. the athletic budget let's see if we have any questions and then that way we don't bombard you at the end yeah. on stuff that you talked about a few minutes ago I, I did I wanted to ask one question about and this is such a a minor expense that you outlined here, but yep. with the fact that the in, the larger class size is coming up from the middle school, are there saxophones that aren't going to be used at the middle school that could be used at the high school, or is that not available? It's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's looking like deer in headlights. Sorry, yeah. Mr. Keller. I just wondered because if they were coming and they must have been playing before... It's, you know, just a question. Is this the Barry Sax? Yeah, yeah, so currently we have six kids at the high school, and we only have four instruments. And I'm hearing there's a student that's coming up. That uh, could be a seven. So currently we don't have enough instruments. For oh, you currently current don't students. for this Correct. year. Got yes. it. Yes. Got yeah. it. That's yeah. what. All right. Sorry. Um, I'll go this way. Kelly. Well, I, I just want to, how does that work if there's four kids that? They share mouthpieces. They piece. share mouthpieces, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. They each have yeah. their own mouthpieces. <laughs> 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 we have it. We have like, it. Okay. Um, Mm. They're not so, always in the same class. It said rotates it, so it around. Made it very I don't know. No. Yeah, we have to. Um, I think that was a great question, Lori. And I just want to say that this is something because Craig, our SML 
K-12 is looking at, you know, really seriously, and he's come here and, pre and presented before about all of the um, savings that he's been able to do, um, before we, he would make a recommendation like that, would look at his inventory across both buildings. Um, and yes, the answer is they that they have their own mouthpieces and they don't play at the same time of the day. They don't. Okay. Yeah having played sax so <laughs> so they do not have an instrument then that they can each take home to practice on not a berry no, no not a berry nope I don't know a lot about saxes they're very well, berry is one they're of the ones, yeah. one yeah. the ones you can't bring on the bus correct right. correct oh, yes. I don't know if we want to start <laughs> that conversation at this point <laughs> <laughs> yes. that's one of those instruments the bus <laughs> sax is better than imagine if you try to put that bus across yeah. the bridge uh, across the bridge <laughs> 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 Mr. Graziano, um, as, as we're getting punchier. So I, I don't have any questions about the high school budget specifically. It seems I, like all the other ones well thought out, but this is more just a general confirmation slash observation, Dr. McLeod. So as we went through every single one of these budgets. Do we not have a single personnel ad that's not net funded somehow? Oh. I wasn't ready for that question. I will be ready next uh, I'm week. No, I'm pretty. I'm, um. in, in these in these presentations, I think every single personnel ad was either offset by a reduction or offset by he, an I alternative can't think source of funding. Out. We, is, we have a point two total. Yeah, a little think bit. We have a point six <laughs> <laughs> minus the point four. Very little, but that <laughs> overview. But, but, yeah, so yeah. point two. I think the Hopkins one was offset by no, it was offset by the on not, the special ed budget. Yeah, but I mean, there, but it nets out somewhere in the budget. We work very hard to do that. Yeah, and we will so I'm have just more pointing that out as as a really positive observation okay. in terms of how we're being smart with our personnel across the district is that it's not only looking at the ads, but looking yeah. at what can, Dr. McLeod, you talk about this all the time, what can we do without that we've used before? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a pretty significant accomplishment from a budgetary perspective thank to you. be able to run basically net neutral on personnel. Yeah, thank you. So that's all I had. This is Kevin. So I, I just I want to uh, commend the creative thinking of bringing in the three additional F1 visa students to offset the personnel increase. It, it question just to piggyback off it: the ten thousand co-curricular increase is related to the F1 visa kids, and that's factored into the tuition that they're paying, or is that separate? That the we use the tuition that they pay to fund the ten thousand dollars. There's an offset at the bottom of that section uh, for F-1 visa. Okay. Yeah. I think that's great. Um, well, I have an observation and then two questions. First mm -hmm. is, I hope you guys have this much fun doing your budget on the town side. Because yeah. we laugh a lot over here. Actually, <laughs> that, <laughs> um, but I think the reason we're having so much fun this year is really, like, there's really nothing to argue about. I think everything is is just staff driven i mean there're no huge asks and i and it, it's not because we're skipping over something that's important it's cuz we've done a lot and um and so we're just having a sort of it feels like a celebratory year and yeah. i just this is a different feeling than i've had in the last 8 so it's enjoyable and we had cookies so that's good um my two questions are uh, one is just more of a suggestion. Uh, um, as I think Mrs. Bolello was talking about looking for funding from HEF or HBTA, maybe I don't know if the Music Association can help offset, even though it's a small cost, the saxophones. That would be super nice if they would be willing to do that. Um, and then really my only real question, I remember in the past you have talked about space constraints here. Mm -hmm. And um, adding the staff obviously is important for the additional students, but are you, I mean, do you, <laughs> where are they going to sit? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, we've seen this this class, the class of 2021, coming for a few years now. And so we've made adjustments. We have taken some of our space here and turned them into classrooms where it was an office maybe before or, or a seminar room. Um, and so we feel that we're in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, if the classes continue to get big, then I think we, we might have a bigger conversation. But at this point, I feel with this class coming in, we should still have enough space. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hur? Uh, do we have two assistant principals? Yes. In the contracted services, what is that? The whole, the entire budget? It's a $738 amount. It's a 7338 item. It's a fairly new item. Yeah, it is. So um, similar to 
uh, what Doc, uh, Mr. Keller was saying about his uh, adjustment council and the start program that they have about students coming back from concussions and, and illness and they come back into to school. Uh, we're on our second year of the grant and next year uh, will be the final year of the grant. And so then we have to put that position in our budget if we feel it's, it's worthwhile, which I, I strongly believe that it is. Uh, there's a lot of contracts and consultations that are also part of the grant that we are shifting over to our budget to make sure that when we present this next year, we, we're not presenting the entire grant. So we're kind of doing it in pieces. So there's a small, well, there's an increase here of look, about $6,000 more than usual, but we're taking that money that is typically funded through the grant and doing it through our contracted services. Have a cookie. <laughs> I'm just making sure I'm not forgetting anybody tonight because I had a, a bad history. Maybe of that he's taking day. notes about how to make his budget process more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kamala, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Manning? Cookies. Manny? Cookies. <laughs> no, no question. Great. All right, Mr. Bishop, okay. we can move on to athletics. All right, great. So for the FY18 athletic budget, um, so it, it may look like there is some significant uh, increases at first glance. Uh, the department. In my opinion, and in, in Ms. King's opinion, our new athletic director, um, as well as our assistant principals, has really been operating in a way that we feel doesn't maximize the opportunity experience that is necessary for, for our athletes and our coaches the last few years. Um, there were significant needs that we identified throughout the course of the beginning of the year, um, and many were cut prior to this proposal in order to bring light the most essential deficits and needs, in our opinion. So there are three specific uh, expense accounts, uh, but I'll first start with the personnel. We're not actually adding any personnel. Uh, however, similar to the teaching staff, uh, coaches receive steps and contractual increases that is part of the HTA collective bargaining agreement, and therefore there is an increase of, of $25,000 from FY18 compared to FY17. In regards to the expense summary, there are three accounts. Uh, the first is the contracted services account that's up $17,000, and, and a large portion of that, almost the entire um, $17,000, is to support funding of the use of the Fruit Street turf field for our field hockey program. Uh, that's a sport that needs to be played on turf at this point. Uh, very few schools play it on grass. Um, and, and we were lucky enough to play most of our games there this year uh, with help from Park and Rex and, and finding money for that. So we want to make sure we budgeted for it this year. Uh, a little bit more of that is also budgeted for the spring uh, when there's snow on the ground to get some of our lacrosse and maybe softball and baseball teams out on that turf as well. Um, the second account that's up uh, a little bit is our professional development account, up at about $5,000. Uh, and that's really for some specific certifications that in the past we've been having our coaches pay on their own or that many of them don't at this point have. And so uh, the first is around the mandated coaching fundamental certification uh, that you can see is $95 per coach. Every coach needs that at least before they start coaching. And there's a lot of turnover in certain um, staffs. Uh, the mandatory CPR and first aid certification, that's every two years. And so we're, we've set a cycle that we know who has it and who doesn't. So we need to make sure we budget for that this upcoming year. And associated, uh, association membership fees, which many of our varsity coaches need to, to participate with. So uh, we a lot of 300 per sport. Uh, I think some sports are going to lean a little bit more and some a little bit, a little bit less. But that's depending on after we kind of sit down and kind of figure out who needs the certifications, who needs the, the CPR. We feel like 300 a sport uh, will be enough to be able to fund this all. And then the third account is the supply account, and that one's up uh, a little over $19,000, and that's to purchase uh, new uniforms for our athletic teams that have gone uh, some six, even more years without getting new team apparel. And when we did a survey with other TVL communities, the average is uh, four years uh, of replacing uniforms for their sports teams. So we're a little bit behind there. We wanted to be a little bit proactive as opposed to being reactive. Um, so we have implemented a new uniform cycle, as you can see in this uh, table. Um, and hopefully with this in place, we'll have a little bit more of a predictable annual cost when it comes to uniforms over the next uh, number of years. So those are the three accounts that I wanted to highlight. Uh, there were other increases, certainly, that we wanted to put in here. But like I said, we made some appropriate difficult cuts. And uh, these focus on our kids and our coaches. And that was our top two priorities. So. Um, my one question with the uniforms yeah. is, is, do you have any idea if, I mean, obviously each sport is really different, but I mean, is 
like how many sports are impacted by 19,000 this year? Like how many how many are we updating for this coming budget cycle? The, the FY18 budget? Yeah. Yeah, so that would be the 2017-18 list of the two okay, soccer's cheerleading cross country. Yeah. So, so the plan is going forward these are the other ones that will Yeah, we were able to fund uh, the uh, boys lacrosse uniforms that was been at least uh, 8 years uh, with that uniform so we wanted to update that and that has been we've been able to find that money within our existing budget. And so this will be starting next year and going forward. This question might actually be for Mr. Dumas, but I mean, there's fees associated with the sports and the high schools. So, do any of those fees offset these expenses? Yes, they do. Uh, at the bottom of Form One, uh, you see the offset of $186,750. Yeah. That's made up of um, uh, uh, $155. Per sport uh, user fee plus all of the gate receipts like from football games and basketball games okay all right that's all the questions I had Kelly um, I just it just brought to light not even a question for you but more for for the people involved in the, the turf field are you taking this type of information into those meetings to talk about you know, cost offsets if we have our own field we're not using 17,000 so that's already part of your we will be, yeah. we will be. <laughs> now that we have that number absolutely yeah, we, it's, have that a, number. it's a topic yeah. that we've had on the docket yeah it's got just a really now. important yeah. aspect yep. of yeah that okay yeah no, I didn't have any questions thank you Mr. Rosanna? Uh, no questions just a comment I know I had a previous conversation with Dr. McLeod and Mr. Dumas on this topic I think the, the look into this program that you and Ms. King have done, I think, is clearly much needed and has, has raised some important issues like the uniform cycle, but also learning that our coaches were actually paying for their own certifications, I think also speaks to another level of their dedication, but this is something that I think we should be paying for Great. at the district for them. So I, I'm really pleased to see that as an additional expense. Ms. Kenna? I'm all set. Thank you. Um, my my one question is, or actually two. The uh, I really think this is awesome to have a uniform re replacement cycle that makes planning so much easier. I just am curious if um, is the cost pretty similar across all of these years? Yeah. So as well, yeah, that's a good question. Because there's yeah. very you know there's different numbers of teams in each. Yeah. Cost. So we tried to set this up by the the, the sports that have. Uh, receive uniforms or, or haven't received uniforms in, in the last few years, but also taking the number of kids in each one of these sports and trying to divvy them up from year to year. So the average, if you look at the amount of kids in some of these sports, kind of averages out from year to year. So there's not football and, and, so, and another large sport in the same year. We tried to make sure we, we separated those so there's not one year that's more expensive than the next. And so, but this, On is, average. this is just uniforms, not equipment. So like this it's is not football. No, that's yeah, no, nope, that's different. Yep, uniforms. this is just okay. the uniforms. Yep, and then just the way it works. If you didn't know, the, the uniforms get passed down from the varsity level to the JV, the JV to the freshman, freshman to eighth grade when we get new uniforms. I'm, I'm familiar with the waterfall. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then um, I did have another question. Oh, I guess it isn't a question, but just a just a reminder that we have already had the conversation when Mr. Rogers was here about the improvements to the fields. Mm -hmm. And all of that, and so that's not in this budget. That's in the buildings and grounds budget. But that's something that we're also committed to absolutely. supporting. Yeah, right? yep, so, okay. absolutely. Yep. But it's in that other budget. Apropos yeah. of our turf field yep. conversation. Yep. So, okay. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Manning. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, you say that the field hockey team on turf is, is it by a regulation or? No, 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 it, no. It must might be a strong word. Uh, it, it puts our students at comp competitive disadvantage if we're playing all of our games on grass. Um, I'd say uh, there's been teams that have not scheduled us because of our grass fields, and so sometimes we're not getting games. And so most of the teams around here are playing on turf. Every college around the area is playing on turf, and so we're one of the only schools around here that's still playing on grass. And so that's why we feel it's necessary to play. So, so other teams will not play us because it's that's on correct. Grass? Not correct. Because it's in poor shape, just because it's well. Nice. Correct. Okay. The next question I have is um, the seventeen thousand, or the large portion of it, that is the cost of play on the Fruit Street field. How is how is that rate determined? And that's is, determined is, is through that, parks and rates. Yeah. I mean, it's the town mm -hmm. taxpayers pretty much supporting the turf, and you're paying to use it. But 
Well, I believe it's it's eighty five dollars an hour, from my understanding. So he currently it has been set at eighty dollars an hour. Um, and so when you take we, the, uh, yeah. we met with Parks and Rec just today um, to have a conversation about all of this, um, and so we will be updating the school committee on where that stands. Do you have the number for next year, or for for what we expanded this year? Okay. No. I'll but it was it was calculated based on the amount of games that we'd be playing and the amount of practices we'd like to get on. There. So there's 10 home games as well as a, a practice schedule. Do we get the in-town rate or the out-of-town rate? What That's what we met about today. That's what we're meeting about. We're currently getting the in-town rate, um, but but we're meeting with Parks and Rec to, to talk about our ongoing collaboration, you know, on both ends, their use of the buildings and our use of the fields, and we're having some great conversations around it. Yes, Mr. Herr. So there's another entity involved in those fields, and that's the soccer. Yep. Uh, youth soccer association or whatever it is, and that's a private entity. Mm -hmm. Private money is part of this process, and that's with the combination of, of town funds, taxpayer money, private money comes together. So, uh, yes, it's public land and public funding, but it's not as simple as some would think. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. That's a good point. Mr. Hurd, did you have any additional questions? Um, is the new uh, Alpine ski racing in the budget? Yes. That's well, well, not, not technically. It's, 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 it's not self-sustaining. Yeah, it's a self-sustaining, but it's budget neutral. Right? Budget neutral. But, yeah. so the, but it's we, in the budget lines. Yeah. Right. To explain, so when we when that program was brought to um, this committee last year, we as a committee decided that along with the recommendation of the athletic director and Dr. McLeod that in order to look at new sport programs in the school, we would give them a two-year trial period where they were budget neutral and self-sustaining based on the fees that were charged to the students so that we could evaluate participation, ongoing costs, and be able to plan the budget ahead of time so that it wasn't a shock when the, if the pilot program was successful. So the Alpine ski team is a program that's available, but at this point, it's not in impacting our budget. Am I explaining that correct for, for this correct. year and yes. next and year? And next year, yeah. yeah. Is that just ninth grade through twelfth? There was some talk about that going to eighth grade. It's currently ninth through twelfth. Molly, all set? I have a ah! <laughs> Not enjoying this anymore. Not the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure I understood Did you say the, the turnover rate amongst the coaches is high? No, no, not, no, no, no. I'd say in some of the sub varsity sports, there is a turnover, but I wouldn't say it's high. Yeah. I would say it's a typical turnover. Okay. So, therefore, if, if, if the town Ah. It's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if paying for their certificates is going to be a reason why they would stick around. I think it's the experience of in, in working in the in our athletic program. But I think it would help. That I think them having to pay for it, I don't think, has been a great practice. Um, and I think it'll show, like like Mr. Graziano said, a, a support that is needed. I feel like from our athletic department to our coaches. Sorry, one more. Um, so we talked about, I think, a lot with Mr. Rogers, but the athletic fields and that contract we're going to look at or bring in somebody for the game day fields and yes. all that. That's in a separate budget. Yes. And there's going to be an increase there to paying. It has already been um, discussed, and that remains currently in the budget, right. yes. That Irrigation power. and game fields. Right. So yep. it's an increase in contracted services for building and grounds. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so this concludes the budget review portion of our meeting this evening, and um, we'll be doing an overview next week, correct? Yes, I guess um, I just wanted to, um, before we conclude tonight's budget, um, look to the school committee for any additional information.
information as I prepare for the preliminary budget recommendation next week. Um, do you have any further information or um, suggestions for where we could look additionally um, beyond what you've heard tonight? And principals, thank you so much. You can go. <laughs> thank, you thank you so much. Our entire audience is leaving. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mrs. Birchman, it looked like you had a comment. Well, I just, um, so we have the updated number as of today, which is only slightly different than last year. But what was the, so what now is the percentage? 4.35. 4 4.35%. Okay. And so your question is? Well, my question is that we've tried to do things a little bit differently this year in, in the piece about the budget uh, recap mm -hmm. and trying to connect the dots between the first budget and this one. And now I'm left to go and work with Mr. Dumas to prepare a final or a preliminary um, superintendent's budget recommendation, um, which we won't be talking about again until after the holidays. So I, I wanted to hear if there were additional places where you wanted me to either provide more information or take another look. I think for me, I, I, I like that. I, I like that we've gotten this updated number each meeting. I think that's been helpful because I think that, you know, it's easier for me to remember one week to, to then for like back to the beginning of the process. So I think most of the stuff that we've expressed concern or hesitation about has already really been factored in. Um, I, there wasn't anything tonight that uh, that I would advocate for taking out at this point. But um, my only lingering question and I know it's embedded in what we've already seen but if we could just see the actual like recap for the preschool on the same format that we see it for the other schools it would just make more sense in my brain Definitely. I understand it's not changing the number and it's embedded in what we've already seen but that would just help me as from a consistency standpoint Thank you. Um, so it's not changing a number but just as far as presentation that'd sure. be helpful Definitely. I think what I would add to that Jean is just seeing it as part of the special ed budget Sure. Because if that's where it's falling. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and I would add that an updated whole district personnel, because I know John's speaking of it being neutral, but I, I know there's some nits here and there. And so just to understand the yep. overall personnel impact. Sure. Anybody else? That's it for me. I echo what Jean said, that getting the weekly updates where, like, the when we saw the air conditioning come out, you know, that came out from one meeting to the next right. meeting, so that was already addressed. That was, I don't see anything tonight that I would request, but I echo getting the preschool budget and the special ed okay. updated. I mean, are you also asking in terms of like slides for the? No, I'm good okay. with that. All right. But unless you have something different. I mean, I don't remember off the top of my head, yeah. but I always love to see the class size, obviously, yes. which is embedded in here, too, but obviously yep. on there. And um, and I just think, you know, it was really nice today to see the achievement and the results yep. of the investment. That. So mm -hmm. that's great. and Super. Yeah. Any comments, Nancy? I know this is your first one, so you don't have a lot of comparison, but is there anything that you had? No, I think it's been a nice process. I mean, your first one that you participated in. I knew what you meant. I know you've side. watched many of them, so. On the edge of my seat. Mr. <laughs> Graziano, you were making lots of faces over <laughs> there, so. He's doing math. He always does. Do if, you want, if you want to think more, <laughs> let me ask Mr. Herr, Mr. Kamalo, or Mr. Manning. I'm happy to come back to you. What's your math? About? Yes, that'd be fine. Okay. Mr. Herr, did you have any additional comments or areas of concern based on all of your viewing? I think it's been very thorough. Um, I think it's very similar to what we get uh, in town hall when department heads come in and they make fantastic cases for what they've done with funding and what you know what the results are, and then they make comments <coughs> for what they need to keep things going forward. And everybody that comes in makes a great case. And then you have to sit there and decide, you know, after they all leave, what really can we afford and what has to kind of get held up for a little bit. Uh, it's a tough job. But no, I think so far, I think it's been great. 
Thank you. Mr. Kamal? I have no additional comments. Uh, again, other than to uh, commend the very professional presentations that I listened to. Yeah, our principals never fail to impress us, that's no. for sure. Um, Mr. Manning. No, I agree. It's been a good process so far. Um, the one ask I would have, I know, was left and asked them to go to 2.5% all for the town. And so I would off request 3% from the schools. I know that sounds like it's probably not, we talked, it's not really achievable. You know, you're at 4.3? 4, 4. 4.35. Is there any way that you can, you know, for next week when you're or next time, break it down that maybe what is strictly level services? And then what I know, you know, you have the languages and there's a few extra things that are, that are you feel is very important. But like you said, we have maybe decisions have to be made or maybe they don't. But at least if you know exactly what our level services, it's just something that's more of a summary to be helpful to make decisions or not. Well, what, what makes level, level service would be easy in general education. It's the uh, increase in cost of special education. That, I do understand the special, yeah, yeah. The, the, the special ed is, is slightly different to a maybe, maybe not, you know, because you're just determining what is absolutely necessary for, for the school and you consider yeah. that level service it's the need is increasing. Sure. Mike I think um, John's request I think it was John's on the whole district personnel and the school committee's interest in understanding clearly depicting the ins and the outs will really help with that question because I think that's what you're asking is you know when I when I hear you say level service I would say that every single year uh, the needs change but as we've said tonight we have not been doing this. We've been looking at how can we do things differently. And I think what would help the community would be to, to see that really clearly. And so the whole district personnel, as well as this is what we added, this is what we reduced in order to put this, and this is the result, um, would answer that question, I think. But but that's great feedback. I understand. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can I ask, this is sort of a general question about, because we've talked about level service, um, you know, across the years, and certainly in our department, like this year, with science standards, and we've had, um, you know, we've had a series in the school department of unfunded mandates in terms of technology requirements from the state and um, curricular requirements from the state, and I have no doubt that other departments have similar changes that come that, that you need to put in place. And so it always sort of begs a question for me, that's not a level service because it isn't something that we have, but it also isn't, a, it's not a want, it's not a, it's not a nice to have either. So I, I never really know what category that type of programmatic change falls into. Um, and I think that it would be really nice if there was a, 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 if we were able to find sort of a consistent term that applied to that across departments so that people at town meeting would understand that, you know, this is what we have. This is an add-on to that, but it isn't really optional, I guess. And then there's also, these are, you know, strategic initiatives or options or, or new, new creative initiatives that we think are also important, which doesn't mean something should necessarily get chopped off, but I just, I think there are different I think level services doesn't necessarily capture all of the categories of requirements. Always, I, I, I don't it's not I an don't answer. I don't disagree with yeah, that, but I, like every other, I know school, the schools. There's always a lot of moving parts year over year. You don't know how many students you're going to have. Right. These are it, it is much more difficult. But how do you put it the same kind of way to look at it as all the departments? Maybe you can or cannot, but that's just one way to visualize it. Well, I just think in general, I think the, the, the budget message, and we talked about this a little bit, 
and the target and then the concept of level services and you get mandates and you know, those are mostly I've never heard of any funded mandates and they're all <laughs> right. you get mandates from the state and the federal level um, but I think in general the, the we're probably a little bit ahead of ourselves on the message this year and I think you know we're going to have to acknowledge that we got a little ahead of the curve there or behind the curve there and uh, just deal with the realities that are in front of us we're making massive investments community. They're going to be great assets, but we're going to pay for them. And everything else is kind of pretty much in line. I mean, I don't see anything crazy. But that said, we're still going to have to do everything we can between now and May to be as conservative and uh, responsible as we can. Uh, but I don't see anybody not doing that anywhere in town. Certainly not here either. But we want to keep looking. You know, we owe it to the taxpayers to do it until mm -hmm. we can't do it. Go ahead, Mr. Clown. In fact, from a budget development, big picture perspective, I think this is the process that, 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 that I find the most. This is where all the work gets done. Because by the time we're putting together a comprehensive budget, it's just one. Say it to, to my colleagues that I, at times I hear the distinction between uh, the town and the government services departments and what percentage increases should be assigned. I, I get that. At the practical level, it really doesn't matter. Because by the end of the day, um, that distinction is very artificial. Uh, it's superficial. Uh, like I'm saying it, for example, health insurance, you may be looking at how many staff you're getting here, but by the end of the day, you're not looking at the comprehensive cost because there's health insurance that needs to be paid from another budget. Uh, so my message being, you are doing the, the heavy lifting here, and uh, this is the work that at least helps us when we have to put together the comprehensive budget. Uh, by the end of the day, you may look at you may look at level sets. Um, does help for discussion purposes. However, when we're putting together the final budget, we, we need to know what does the town absolutely have to pay for. And we usually break it down into the following components. What are the needs that you've identified here? What are the contractual services that we absolutely have to pay for? And what are the fixed costs? And Last year, we have had the opportunity to then say, after we've prayed for this first three, what are the strategic initiatives that you've identified, discussed thoroughly here, that we should put for money. But this year, it's going to be time. So the, the, the facial expressions I was making earlier when I was, was thinking are probably, and I think that the, the comments have, have sort of fallen in line with that are sort of the facial expressions I make at this stage of the process every year because <laughs> this is where so we, we we've gone through all of these we've had some comments we've had some of the the department heads and and principals and other administrative staff going back and making some some smart adjustments some at our request some on their own um, to get down to 4.35 percent I know that you know Mr. Her uh, acknowledged that sort of we maybe we're out a little bit ahead of the budget message. I think one of the reasons we even collaboratively adjusted the budget message was that three percent. We were pretty clear, and I think you can see through this process isn't remotely feasible. Um, so, I, but I look at four point three five percent, and part of me wants to say, well, if we had to, where would we go? I'm hesitant to ask that question for next week because two for two reasons. One given the, the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness of these budget presentations, and I think as Mrs. Birchman said, there wasn't really a big ticket something to fight over um, in this. I'm pretty positive I wouldn't like it. Um, that being said, 4.35 is where we are. To Mr. Kamala's point, I, I don't know where that fits into the big picture, and we probably can't get that until later in the process. So I, I think while I, I, part of me wants to say, what would it look like if, if we get, come back and, and you know, get asked to do something more, but I feel like it's premature to, to look at that. So that's a really long-winded way of saying that I don't think I have anything else to ask for for next week. <laughs> All 
Um, Dr. McLeod, I, I want to thank you for um, meeting your entire team in such a, a very complete process this time. I mean, I this is not an easy process for me without a finance background, so you know I struggle with spreadsheets, but I, I felt like it was one of, I mean, it's my third budget cycle, and it's been the clearest. Um, I echo what all my colleagues have said about not having any asks. I don't have any asks for next week, although I listen to the town officials and understand the constraints that we're under. But I also agree that at this time, I don't know what I would deprioritize based on all the presentations that we've had. I mean, I, I already did make asks during the presentations that have been looked at. And it'll be interesting for me to see the summary next week, and maybe that will trigger something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I was extremely impressed with the presentations this year, and I really felt like the justifications were there. Um, and what really strikes me is, and what I really hope we do in our presentation to the town in May, is show those results. Because I don't think that the town appreciates investment that they allowed us to do in the past few years with changing major programs within the elementary schools and even in the middle school, how much achievement they've had there, to see that their money is actually, it's manifesting itself in their students and their kids. And so I, I do want to prioritize that for us with our message because it, the spend the spend is immense and it is for the town but it but it's not wasted and so that I feel like is a really important part of this message in which it was important for me to see it again mm -hmm. and it's exciting to see again and it also was really great for the principals to be able to feel that appreciation for us, from us that we see what tremendous growth that is and in such short periods of time so I, I, that part I think think has to be a portion of our budget message. Definitely. So. Um, thank you, Lori, for those comments. And, and um, I will definitely begin with that as part of the presentation um, because we've said all along that this takes three years, and that's where we are. Mm -hmm. So we don't see these trends, but we looked for their trust. Um, we looked for the community's trust through you in supporting these budgets, saying we don't have this data, but we will. You know, it takes three years, and now you see it, and it's been three years. So I think that's a really great place for us to begin um, the presentation next week. And I yeah. and I do want to mention that um, while it wasn't our goal in having Full Day Kindergarten to be the leader of our communities around us, but I know for a fact Southboro met this week. Um, their school committee and they were trying to bring out in full force their parental support for full day kindergarten in their district because they they don't have it um, and they were using our successes as an example and so while that you know does nothing for our bottom line but it's it's impressive to be that district that's that's being an example and a positive example so um, it's also probably the reason why we're seeing so many increase in students <laughs> because people are coming here, but but that's a I, I see that as a positive problem to deal with. So, thanks. well, you know what? If they were only coming for kindergarten and then leaving, I would worry. <laughs> <laughs> they are coming and they are staying yeah. for the entire program um, that we have to offer. And offset our meteoric rise, though, of towns like Ashland and Southboro do use us as an example of. Yeah it'll improve their district and then right, right there's more options for people a domino effect yeah mm -hmm. good so. thank you Th that's those comments are extremely helpful in um in preparing for for next week thank you all so i think we can excuse you unless there's any other comments but thank you very much for taking part in all of this process yeah. we obviously we'll be doing a summary next week which you're all invited to um i know how much time this takes so thank you so is, is tomorrow just, you. or is next week your just your presentation of there's no more no it's no a, more we already there's no the more board. budget presentation but okay. it is our regular meeting it's our regular meeting during which you'll do a I'll do it app. you'll provide your feedback we'll come back in January mm -hmm. with another opportunity to take another look at it and then we'll have the um, public, the forum public forum right. on the night
special meeting. So at this time in the agenda, we're at public comment, which we're a little behind schedule, but there's no one here. So we grab 10 minutes and we can move to items by consensus, <laughs> which prior to me turning it over to Dr. McLeod, I wanted to double check that there was no one on the committee that had any questions or wanted to pull anything out from the items by consensus. Okay, um, Dr. McLeod. Thank you. The superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined in the agenda below. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Cavanaugh, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And I believe it's unanimous, and so carries. And at this time, I would seek a motion for adjournment. And I'm really hard, trying hard, Nancy, to see. So I'm going to go by my phone at 9:49. Thank you. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And our next meeting will be next Thursday at 7 p.m. here in the high school library. And we will be complete, concluding our budget presentations for December. Not quite totally, but for December. And having our regular meeting. So thank you and good night.